44A and 44B, Prospect Hill Street in Quincy. Okay, thank you. Anybody else would like to speak in favor? How about anybody against? Okay, seeing none. Uh, seeing uh, no, no further um, public comment, I will close this hearing at 631. We'll be back in four minutes for the next public hearing. Thank you. The Monday, uh, November 14th, 635 public hearing to order. This is a public hearing for order, uh, Council Orders 2022-133, Utility Grant Location Mass Electric, Verizon, 33 Newport Ave and 2022-134 grant of locations Mass Electric 33 Newport Ave. At this point, I'd like to ask anybody opposed tonight on this matter? Anybody opposed? Okay, how about anybody in favor? All right. Seeing not uh, further public comment is needed, I will close this public hearing at 635, thank you. We'll be back for the next public hearing at 640, um, at 60, 640, thank you. Good evening, uh, everyone, it's uh, close to 640, so I'll, I'll start the, uh, the meeting up. I'd like to call order uh, Monday, November 14th, uh, the 640 meeting of the Quincy City Council Ordinance Committee uh, I'd like to bring it to order. Uh, Madam Clerk, we call the roll. Councilor Andronico. Councilor Kane. Present. Councilor DeBona. Present. Councilor Harris. Present. Councilor Liang. Present. Councilor Mahoney. Present. Councilor Phelan. Chairman McCarthy. Present. Six members, you have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, I'm just gonna read the open meeting law for a sec. Pursuant to the open meeting law, any person may make an audio or video recording of this public meeting or transmit the meeting through any medium Attendees are therefore advised that such recordings or transmissions are being made, whether perceived or unperceived, by those present and are deemed acknowledged and permissible. Uh, tonight, uh, we have the Quarry Hills lease extension. Uh, I see uh, representatives from Quarry Hills here and uh, folks from the public. Um, before we start, I'd like to uh, turn it over to uh, Mr. Walker, uh, the Mayor's Chief of Staff, uh, who'd like to go over a few things. Mr. Walker? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, through you. Um, it's a pleasure for me tonight, on behalf of Mayor Koch, to present you the Home Rule Petition that will authorize the city to execute a new 100-year lease with Quarry Hills Associates for the property we know today as Grant Lakes Golf Club. I'm joined tonight, although he's not in the room yet, by Solicitor Jim Timmons, who will be able to answer any technical questions. Oh, there he is. Hello, Solicitor. Uh, technical questions relative to the lease itself and the team from Quarry Hills Associates in Granite Links, uh, President Tom O'Connell, Senior Vice President Will O'Connell, General Manager Walter Hannon, Chief Financial Officer Mary Orlando, and Director of Operations Kevin Mason. My understanding through you, Mr. Chairman, is that we expect to handle this process like we've handled in a similar way as we've handled other legislation in the recent past. We're not seeking a vote tonight. We understand the councils will have questions, and we look forward to hearing the input that members of the public We'll have as well. It's our hope that we come away from this evening with questions that we, any questions that we cannot answer, with the, having those questions in hand and the answers uh, soon to follow in very short order. Uh, before I get into the details, I'd like to respectfully ask your indulgence if I go over just a little bit of history. I understand that uh, no member of this current body, with the exception of Council Phelan in his first iteration as a city councilor, uh, was present at the time during the 1990s and, and after uh, when this project uh, took on its face. Um, so the 450-acre site that we know today as Grant Lakes Golf Club uh, for decades was a dump, a literal dump, uh, serving both the city of Quincy and the town of Milton. Uh, during the 1980s, it was a time when the state, rightfully, uh, to protect the, the environment, started ordering municipal landfills to be capped and closed uh, to a very specific condition as to avoid future pollution. Uh, at the time, uh, obviously our landfill at that site was no exception. Uh, the city was under a direct order to close the landfill. At the time, the discussions about what was going to happen, uh, there was a cap that the city had placed on its portion of the landfill. Uh, Milton's was, was untouched, uh, but even the cap that the city had at that time, uh, the 
additional preventative measures that we had to use during that time cost the city about $200,000 a year to prevent the leachate from getting off the site. So it, it was not a fully closed landfill at that time. Uh, the, site, the site was, without question, a financial drag uh, on the city. Enter the Big Dig, the largest public, works projects in, largest public works project in the country's history at that time, and its need to find a place for millions upon millions of cubic yards of fill. What followed was an extraordinary vision and a great effort by a number of people. Mayor Sheets, this body at that time, I see former Councilor Cahill in the audience, he was involved during that time. Former Council Fabrizio was involved at that time. Form, uh, current Councilor, as I mentioned, Council Phelan was involved in that time. Uh, those councillors, members of the community and the private partners um, came up with the program with the end product was a solution that provided a place for the big dig to take its dirt, a landfill closure plan using that dirt to cap the landfill according to state regulations and an extraordinary public private partnership that created a 27 hole championship golf course one of the region's most sought after function facilities, new playing fields for Quincy's young people, and millions of dollars of new revenue for the city of Quincy. The first home rule petition in the 50 year lease dates back to 1994, and there have been several updates and amendments over that time and beyond, uh, the most substantive of which was developed between Mayor Phelan and Corey Hills Associates back in 20, uh, 2002. Uh, that body has before it uh, the 2002 amended and revised lease for comparative person for comparative purposes with the new 100-year lease that is the subject of the Home Rule Petition. Again, the, what's before this body for a vote is the Home Rule Petition that authorizes the city to enter the lease. The council is not being asked to vote directly on the lease, although the draft before you uh, is substantive and we believe it is the working document. You can see from those two documents that the or original lease and the amended version back in 2002 was essentially a construction lease. It spoke to landfill closure provisions, construction standards, the redevelopment of other parcels that were in the immediate area. That work today is all long done, and the language that guided that document back then is no longer operable. Uh, so the new 100-year lease that is the subject of the Home Rule Petition eliminates much of that original construction-related language and becomes more so an operational lease. It keeps in, maintains the core, provision of the core provisions of the original lease that relate to the ongoing function of the facility guarantees 10% of all gross golf-related revenue to the city, guarantees 10% of all other net revenue from the, from the facility to the city. That's functions, alcohol, food, uh, for the most part. It strengthen strengthens the language related to the city's playing fields that will facilitate major improvements to those fields, and it provides Quarry Hills language to allow for major capital investments under all normal planning and zoning requirements by the city. So why are we doing this now and why for 100 years? Uh, there's two reasons. One is principle, one is practical. The principle is simply, it worked. This new lease is a validation of all that work that made it happen. Mayor Phelan, Mayor Sheets, the councils I mentioned, Council Phelan, Council Fabrizio, Council Cahill, all those members of the council at that time, the members of the community, the state legislative delegation, all the members that served on the community advisory committees back then, the facility has matured and it is working about as well, if not better, than anyone involved back in the 1990s could have possibly imagined. Uh, it only makes sense for the city to provide long-term stability that will continue the partnership and continue the success and expand upon that success. Just a couple of touch points. Last year, the city received close to $700,000 as part of the revenue share I mentioned a little bit ago. Uh, that's compared to just over $200,000 uh, a decade ago. So as the course, the club, the popularity of the facility has grown, so too has the revenue to the city of Quincy. It's 500 jobs at the facility, almost half of them held by Quincy residents. More than 30,000 30, rounds of golf every year, about half of that broken up between membership play and public play. And obviously Quincy residents get a discount uh, and that will continue going forward. Uh, and ball fields that are there today, utilized by thousands of our young people over the course of the last however many years that, that it's been open. And just it's a stock reminder that when this process started and that vision started between the private partnership and the city, that that place was a wasteland. It was costing the city money and it was nothing going on up there. And now we have everything that I just mentioned above. So yes, 
This lease provides a level of permanency, but permanency is what we believe and what is what we want for something that has been this successful. Again, it worked. Uh, beyond that is the practical need. The practical need and the driving reason from the private side, and they can, and Mr. O'Connell and the team from Grant Links can certainly answer any questions relative to that, is that site control is needed to make major capital investments. With time drawing down on the original lease, the lease is becoming an obstacle to maintaining the existing asset, asset and fostering future growth. The team from Quarry Hills obviously will be able to answer questions on that point, but the fact is site control is a critical element to any kind of major long-term capital financing, and the current lease no longer provides that. We know that Granite Links has a number of capital needs needed to su support the growth it has enjoyed over the last several years. In, in particular, parking is one under current conditions that the folks from Granite Links know they need to address that immediately in the near term. Um, the new lease provide our partners with the stability of site control they need to make near-term investments, but also creates the potential for longer-term growth. And again, if Granite Links increases its revenue, the city increases its revenue. If Granite Links succeeds, the city succeeds. So it behooves us to provide them the tools they need. The city is well aware, uh, and I think everyone in this audience tonight and members of this body have been there, I'm well aware that the access point to Quarry Hills via Furnaceburg Parkway and Willard Street and Rusciutti Drive needs to be addressed. That is a current condition issue that needs to be addressed regardless of anything that happens in the future. We know, understand that bottleneck. It's been like that for some time as the popularity of the ball fields, as the popularity of the golf course, as the popularity of the function facility has grown, uh, so too has the issue at that crossing. We know it's an issue. Um, we've discussed with MassDOT how to fix that issue. They're currently in the design phase of a major improvement to that crossing that will address the immediate need. That doesn't necessarily mean that's the only thing that can happen, needs to happen if long-term, if there are any other um, matters going forward up at the golf course, but that issue is we are on the tip list. We expect to be have DEP, uh, I'm sorry, DOT ready for public discussion of a plan for that design in the very near future. In your packages, councils tonight, you also have documentation related to some questions I know you've all received relative to the status of walking trails and access points to the Blue Hills Reservation. Uh, the process that took, pla took place way back when on this issue was outside of the lease. It was not part of the lease agreement, but was rather part of the state permitting process relative to the landfill closure. The documents you have in front of you this evening get into the history of this issue. Mr. O'Connell and the team can certainly elaborate on it. They show that Quarry Hills has long been in compliance with the requirements as directed by the state DEP. You also have a map in your package that shows the access points as directed by the DEP process. And I'm sure, again, the team from Quarry Hills will be happy to answer any questions you may have about that part of the history of the project. Uh, with that, Council, I'll turn it back over to the body. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Walker. Uh, folks, at, at this point, um, we're going to have a public comment period. So I'd like to ask anyone wishing to speak on Council Order 2022-131 to come to the podium and state, state your name and address. Uh, there's also a sheet in the back for those folks that want to put down if they're in favor or opposed or put their comments down on the sheet that's in the back if you don't want to come up to the podium, but make sure you put your, your name and address. So we'll open it up right now and feel free to be the first one to walk up to the podium. Are right, you in? Yes, sir. Ask. Yes. Okay. I'm Ann Meyerson. I live at 174 North Central Avenue. Um, and I would like to state that I am strongly opposed to the concept of a home rule petition to have a 100 year lease. And very simply, I feel that a commitment of 100 years is irresponsible on the part of the city. Um, I cannot imagine what the city and the world will look like in 100 years, and I strongly do not think that we should commit ourselves to it. I would also like to state that I feel there's not been any opportunity for public input on the use of the land, on um, how it should be handled until this suggestion came up. And finally, 
I do want to say that if, in fact, this has been so successful, the city would be in a better position to negotiate and take some competition um, to see who might even be more successful rather than tying us up for 100 years. So thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening. Hi, my name is Lori Earle. I live at 118 Billing Street in North Quincy. Um, and I actually haven't said anything up here since I tried to fight for middle school foreign language to stay <laughs> in the school system many years ago, um, which was not successful. But um, I just uh, was a bit astounded at the idea of a 100-year lease as well. Um, the fact that I had not heard or seen any information out in the public about this decision that was kind of almost sounded like it was a done deal um, when I first read about it. And so it just seems um, I'm really a, a proponent of saying let's have more community input in this conversation, community members who might be part of this council that makes this decision. Um, you know, uh, maybe some clar clarity in terms of the over in terms of the oversight of the development expectations and plans. Um, is it in writing that the city will continue to get these same kinds of revenues from additional? You know, there's divisions between what you get 20% on and 10%. I know that the uh, I don't think rent is collected for this, so it's just this revenue, um, and so just the whole. Uh, it just seems very rushed, and um, it's a big piece of land in a prominent location. You're right, nonprofits and all kinds of groups love the event space, and it's fantastic. Definitely, we need improvements with that uh, drive, and I can see why parking would be an issue, but there just needs to be more conversation about this, more transparency, and um, more input from the community, in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Judy Laird Jacobs, the executive director of the Friends of the Blue Hills, and I don't live in Quincy, but I do represent a number of Quincy residents. Um, and I have a list of over 70 people um, from Quincy and from the surrounding area that are interested in this issue. Um, we, I acknowledge all of the benefits that Quarry Hills Associates and this um, agreement has given the, given the city of Quincy. We don't at all oppose the the lease um, and know that Quarry Hills Associates is a really great neighbor. What we have been working on for 25 years as an organization is to increase access to the Blue Hills from um, north of Quincy. And in those 25 years, there's even more people that live in that area and that could benefit from the park. We also know even more now um, the benefits of natural areas on both mental and physical health. Um, we would like to ask um, the city of Quincy to work with Quarry Hills Associates to increase access to the park through a trail, either through or around the park, or perhaps seasonal access. Um, we um, understand that there, um, when we, we have maps that um, the original findings were based on um, that could access the park, but there, um, uh, um, there's certainly options of increasing the park through, through different trails um, and certain access. So we encourage you to think about what sorts of um, public benefit in addition to all of the other um, benefits that are already in the contract that you could also include that would um, increase access to the park. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bill Samsow, 356 Washington Street, Quincy. Uh, Dave, there's a fatal problem with how you opened up this meeting to public comment tonight for both past, past practice by the council as well as MGL. A public hearing, including public comment, should have been duly noted, noticed and advertised. This was not done. Rather, basically the last minute, apparently you decided to open up this hearing to public comment so that I can only assume 
would be able to say that such was done in the context of the proposed and intertwined home rule petition. This is no way to do things. As such, I would strongly advise you to close the meeting immediately and then proceed to duly notice and advertise a future do-over meeting as a public meeting. If you do not, I will file an open meeting law complaint. In turn, not only would, should you thus plan on having to do a full do-over of this meeting, but also redo anything further done before a ruling against you might be promulgated. In case you do not follow, close this meeting forthwith, please consider the following additional points. First off, as regards to concerns expressed about a 100-year lease, you, you all might want to notice that a 100-year lease conveys the property leased to the lessee per Massachusetts law to the lessee upon the end of a duly consummated lease. Next, while the current lease agreement is what it is and is thus set, there are additional as well as considerable financial considerations that would arise care of <clears throat> the proposed 100-year lease proposal. For example, the assessed value of the property is currently $25 million. This in turn would work out to a $600,000 annual tax bill this year were both the land and the property improvements owned by the Con O'Connells outright for standard practice. Mr. Walker uh, said this evening that current payment is about $700,000 and I had to make some revisions to my comments on the fly. But this does not include, in this not include hotel, motel, meals tax, and other things. It's unclear how to be able to parse out how that 700,000 reflects as to what the taxes would be. <clears throat> also, absent more data, it would appear that the current payment may not provide anything left over to, to, towards allocating towards the cost, towards the leasing of the city property to the O'Connell Group. Such pros poses obvious problems. Granted, the original lease was set with some consideration of the fact that the O'Connells took on addressing runoff problems at the old dump sites on the property, as well as various other things. At the same time, if a new lease is to be considered, revisiting the in lieu of discount or ta tax payment on property taxes should be revisited in terms of what the O'Connells <clears throat> did to affect re remediation and any other possible factors. Granted, the old system, city was laying out $200,000, but how much did it cost the O'Connells to solve the problem? Have they already recouped that? If that $200,000 was factored into the consideration of things, it's time to revisit. <clears throat> also, these and all manner of other considerations should be duly calculated by outside experts, as well as preferably those of the council's choosing, or at least duly vetting. Needless to say, such an effort would be complicated. As such, I would propose that the council insist that if a new deal is to be struck, it should be based on a straight sale of the land by the city and that going forward, the property tax levy on the whole of the property be determined per usual practice as opposed to the current, <clears throat> the current in lieu of um, what was reported as the gross, but Mr. Walker said the net. Um, it, doing this would make it so much cleaner as well as there are surely no concerns for the O'Connells about the viability of developing golf food and events, the golf food and events facility two decades ago, because it's up and running, and I'm sure they have fully recouped their speculative outlays and then some. They also got an awful lot of money for tipping the dirt from the big dig. As such, it should be, it sh as it should be a sale, a sale should be put out for bidding per the standard procedures for disposing of city property. Thank you for your time and consideration. Um, good evening. My name is Bob I'm a resident at 20 Turning Mill Lane in West Quincy. I've been a, a, a resident of Quincy for 55 years. Um, and this is the first time I've ever attended a meeting. And the reason I know about it is because at the Pride Festival, that, not this year, but the year before, I, um, there were so many not-for-profit organizations. And I got on email lists um, and of, of these organizations that do have concerns about Quincy and, and 
uh, different parts, like trees and whatever. So um, had I not been there, I, I, I'd, I'd plead ignorance again about some of the issues going on in the city. Um, my, my concerns are more about uh, are practical in that, um, you know, um, the Quincy, as everyone knows who's been here a while, is undergone major um, uh, changes, and, and I'm fine with changes, but um, it sounds like this lease could just totally th um, be the, the, the mega or the magnum of it, is the amount of um, luxury apartments and, and condominiums that have gone up in neighborhoods, and I grew up in the North Quincy Wollaston area. I live on in West Quincy near the Home Depot, um, and I, you know, as much as I appreciate how the beauty of Quincy Center looks, and some of the pride of, of being in Quincy, never expecting to be here this long, um, I, I feel like um, that to allow an 100-year lease with a with a set sort of percentage. Um, and then not knowing what could be additionally developed with that. And I don't know if there's clarity on that and who's the person, is it Mr. Timmons, that would answer some of these questions as far as legal questions. And um, that's, that's one huge concern I have. I'm not, I don't have kids, so I don't know how the traffic problem is other than I, I can barely see the road that goes up to the ball fields because I do go to the, the tavern I uh, never had a bad meal, you know. I'm not a golfer. I tried it once or twice, but I recommend it highly every time I have family, friends to come to the city. Beautiful view. I remember the Quincy Dump vaguely um, and the Big Dig. And so, I mean, there's no doubt about it. The other concern I do have, and I'll, I'll try to keep it as brief as possible, and um, is that... Um, I, I, to be honest with you, I saw this ledger and I saw this, I don't even know where those trails supposedly are that were done or not done, which again, I'd like clarity because I've read that it's, they're not clear, they're not there, and then I've read that they are there, they just had to make it differently. Well, I saw the map on the ledger, I blew it up, I'm like, all right, this is like, so it seems to me very outdated, the entrances are not true to what they are now. Um, and I don't even know what's beyond when I take that bare left there. I assumed it was sort of none of my business to know that there might be access to trails and views when you continue on Rashuti Drive. I never gone beyond that, to be honest with you, because I just didn't think there was anything there for me to do. So I just have practical concerns and lots of questions, and I don't, I don't know how um, the city would want to make decisions without... Um, uh, community impact and community um, input. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sean, and I live in uh, H. Jackson Street in Quincy. Um, the thing that I think originally struck me that got me aware of this issue in the first place was uh, looking at uh, just Google Maps and kind of realizing the absurdity of a situation where Neighbors in uh, neighborhoods in Milton and Quincy, adjacent to Cunningham Park, live less than a half mile from the Blue Hills Reservation, which is one of the largest and well most well preserved uh, green spaces inside of the Route 95 uh, corridor, and they simply cannot walk there, despite the fact that they are separated from the park the DCR land for, by public green space, which exists on public land, uh, city of Quincy land. And it doesn't entirely make sense to me how it can be the case that there can be such little green space in the city of Quincy, um, such hard to access green space in the city of Quincy, and that neighbors uh, can't even pass through it in order to get to their kind of legally the legally allotted public land. Um, so looking into it more, the only reason I became aware of this lease renegotiation was because I, I started proactively asking questions, which I, I'd like to reiterate the, um, the comments about the, uh, 
possible inadequacy of notification about this process. It does seem like by the time I was aware of it and by the time many other people were aware of it, the many other people who are much better informed than I am, uh, that it was already completed and that the lease was already negotiated and ready to be simply signed off on. Um, which to me raises the question, uh, and I don't claim to understand this entirely, there's a lot of details, it's a complicated project, but it sounds to me as though the terms of the lease that were signed in 1994 were obviously acceptable to QHA, and obviously QHA has been able to run a profitable business. Uh, the Patriot Ledger reported that they have paid $4.6 million in revenue to the city in the cost sharing agreement in the last 10 years. So that is an average of $460,000 a year. Um, so if the terms of the lease were acceptable in 1994, when the lease included a long list of obligations that QHA had to adhere to as far as the construction of their uh, the land and the capping of the landfill, then how can it be that the city of Quincy isn't in a position to negotiate a new lease with new provisions? Um, I'm not an expert. I don't claim to have fully understanded, understood the, the leases, but I have read both of the leases. And from what I have seen, there is much more removed from the original lease than has been added into the lease as far as requirements or stipulations for the leases. Um, so it, again, raises the question, if the lease was a good deal for QHA 30 years ago, and the needs and the nature of the city of Quincy have changed dramatically in that time, um, how can the city commit to this effectively the same agreement, but more favorable to QHA and for a much longer time period, a uh, time period where quite literally no one in this room will still be here at the point at which the lease is up for renegotiation. And let me think. I think that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Members of the council, uh, Tim Cahill, 51 Grenwald Road. Um, as Mr. Walker stated, I was on the city council when this lease was first um, and, and voted for the original lease when it came before us. Uh, I believe I was on the council when it was amended as well. Um, and I will tell you, in my role as a city councilor, there wasn't a better vote I ever took. Uh, very rarely can you take a vote that you can look back on 30 years, almost 30 years later, and say that was a great vote. Things worked out exactly the way we hoped they would work out, if not better. <coughs> um, and I say that as a former city councilor. I also say that as the chairman of the Chamber of Commerce, because what Granite League gives to the city is invaluable, because they're a homegrown com company that really looks out for the interests of the taxpayers and the businesses and the people of the city of Quincy. Whether it's weddings, whether it's events, whether it's golf tournaments, whether it's the Boy Scout breakfast that we all attended a couple of weeks uh, last week. Um, and not to pat any of us on the back, myself, Council Phelan, and, and the others were there, but it was a very, very for um, looking forward type of lease where Again, as Mr. Walker said, and I think has been proven, if Granite Links does well, the city does well. And that's the beauty of the percentage as opposed to a standard rate. Um, and it still allows the business to function and to upgrade. Uh, and I know that that's important. It's extremely important. I, you think about their competitors, one of their competitors, which is the Marriott, I think has gone through three owners in the past few years to the point where we don't know where they are, the prices have gone up, and it's almost impossible to do some business there in the realm, in the realm that you did it before. Um, the O'Connells have lived up to every standard of the agreement and in many ways exceeded that, those standards. And I fully believe the next generation, the ones that are before us and the ones that will come after, will continue that stewardship. It's very, very rare and sometimes very frustrating to pass a law 
and see it changed or to pass a piece of legislation and to see it not work or to see it change in ways that n you never intended it to work. And I saw that at the State House as well. Very, very difficult to do that and very frustrating. And this is one of the things where you can actually, you've seen it, it's worked. I think it's worked extraordinarily well for all of the citizens of Quincy. Um, and it will continue to work if it's managed the way it, it, it has been. And that's another thing that I think you can look at. Usually, when we took the vote almost 30 years ago, we didn't quite know what was gonna happen. If you take this vote today, I think you have a pretty good idea of what's gonna happen, because you've seen it over the last 30 years, only it will get better. 100 years is a long time, and none of us will be here. But again, it's very rare for an elected official to be able to make a vote that will have an impact 100 years from now, a positive impact. And if this didn't have a positive impact, I wouldn't be up here uh, at all. And, and I, again, I think it goes to the genius of Mayor Sheets and the administration of the Sheets administration, the O'Connell family, to come together with this public-private partnership, because literally both sides win. The taxpayers win, the businesses win, and the citizens benefit. Probably Granite Links is one of the three or two or three biggest attractions in the city of Quincy. And it attracts people not just from the city, but from all around, all around the Commonwealth and all, basically all around the country. And it's rare to have that and to lose that, especially the way the O'Connell family has run this business, I think would be a travesty. And I think it would be a bigger risk to go out to, to not fool around, but to change what has been working and what we believe in the business community and as a resident for 60 years in the city of Quincy and hopefully a resident for a few more um, that this is a project that has worked extraordinarily well, will continue to work extraordinarily well, and I give it my wholehearted um, backing, and I believe that this council should support it because it works for the city of Quincy. It doesn't just work for the O'Connell family, it works for the entire city of Quincy. And anyone that's had anything to do up there, virtually anyone that, I can, that I've talked to, have had a great experience, a tremendous experience, and it's something that didn't, didn't exist. When I was growing up, that was a quarry that turned into a dump, as did many other parts of, the, of West Quincy and South Quincy, and it has certainly changed dramatically for the better. And I would really encourage you to think about that. You have an opportunity before you to make an impact on this city. We're not talking apartments, we're not talking condominiums, we're talking about basically open space, a golf course, a 27 hole golf course that people can go up and breathe and see the, one of the best sites in, in all of Massachusetts. And I think that's very important to keep that in mind. As the city is being built out, as development comes in, this is something that will lock in what is there right now. And what is there is really beautiful. And I think it's a treasure and it's a jewel to the city. And we should do everything we can to maintain it. So I am fully in support of continuing the lease, adding the years that, the, that is being requested. This obviously will go to the State House. This obviously will be voted on by the legislature one way or the other. And as we've shown, as has been shown, it can be addressed as you go forward because this has been amended. So it's not locking anything in um, beyond the fact that as things change that this council or, uh, or the O'Connells, the parties that at be the city of Quincy can come to try to work out something if something doesn't work. But I think 30 years is a pretty good track record, and if it wasn't as good as it is, I wouldn't be standing here today, and you would have another, a different decision to make, which is who comes next. But um, that, to me, is more the unknown that I would strongly recommend against um, when you have the known that's right here. So I respectfully request that you send this to the legislature with a positive approval, um, and then you work with the legislature to get this passed so that this continues to be uh, such an important part of the city of Quincy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello, Councilors and President. Uh, my name is George Montilio. I'm a resident of Quincy, and um, I've grown up with actually both families, knowing them both, and uh, knowing their backgrounds and how they operate with their father before Walter, knowing Walter and his father. He was just a great guy, and, and Walter behind him as a son and uh, knowing how they run their businesses and uh, I get to work with them a little bit and um, I get to see where the operation 
uh, runs it up at Granite Links. Also, the O'Connells, known them since I was younger and uh, grew up in my neighborhood, uh, being from Quincy. I watched the way they've developed that, as I say, the dump, and they put all that money and time and foresight into it to get it where it is today. It's, it's just amazing that they've got to where they are. And um, that alone was just a major feat, as well as Marina Bay was for the O'Connells. Um, and uh, how they built that veterans tower and done all those special things for the city and given it. I just think it's a, it's a time that we should think about. Um, the people have invested into the city that uh, they've given the chance to go forward and keep their lease in effect or a new lease. Um, and uh, I, I couldn't ask for who would be better than the O'Connells in the uh, hands to do this, something like that. So that's what I'm here to say tonight. Thank you very much. Good evening. My name is Matt Collins. I live at, uh, we live at 77 Reservoir Road, uh, right across from the uh, Furnacebrook Golf Corp Club. And I would thank you for your um, efforts and communication around that project. Um, while I live near the Furnacebrook Club, I'm a member, a proud member of Granite Links. Uh, my dad, Tom Collins, is uh, one of the original members. Uh, my son is a member. He's fortunate enough to have played baseball up there, uh, a lot nicer than the baseball fields that I grew up on. Um, and now he's a member of Granite Links. So um, I think from the member's standpoint, one of the things that the management does a really good job with is the balance between taking care of the members and <clears throat> um, serving the public with regard to the restaurants, the golf, the driving range, and that thing, and we all appreciate that. Uh, from my perspective, I've been very fortunate to bring clients and colleagues from all over the country to Granite Links, and they're blown away. Um, I really think it's one of the things that represents the, the city um, in an extremely positive light, and I absolutely support um, the lease. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening. My name is Joan Falvey. I live on Lyon Street in Quincy. And um, I found out about this meeting um, first from Judy Larragate. Judy Laird Jacobs of the Blue, Friends of the Blue Hills, and then from the Quincy Tree Alliance. Um, but for the emails that I received from them, could, I wouldn't know could about Could you speak this. up a little? Oh, Pull sure. that mic a little closer. But for those communications, I wouldn't know about this meeting tonight. I don't dispute all the good that Corey Hills brings to the area. Um, I guess I would ask, you know, it was a 50-year ground lease initially. I understand why they need a 100-year ground lease, because they're going to finance something. And it seems like um, the carts before the horse, Mr. Walker talked about you know, the DOT looking at the intersection there and already kind of revamping the whole traffic um, patterns and thinking about what should be done there. That to me says expansion. I don't dispute expansion, I think it's a great thing, but we don't know what you're gonna do with a 100-year ground lease, which you need to finance. So I think that is what the parties here are asking about in addition to having those paths evaluated um, and opening up the green space. So just a little bit more forethought and notice to the constituents who are here today to find out what the big picture is. Why you need a 100-year ground lease, because you need it to finance, where it's a hotel or more parking. Um, and you had a 50-year ground lease before. Why was it 50 and not 100? It seems to me the city of Quincy maybe thought about wanting to reevaluate the money that would be coming into them. And that's why they did 50 and not 100. So thanks for listening. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Maria Mulligan. I live um, on Winthrop Ave in, on Wollaston Hill. Uh, thanks for having me here today. Um, I sent you guys a kind of a long-ish letter just before this meeting. I'm um, not going to read all of it to you, but there's a couple of things who already have been discussed. Um, but I wanted to actually ask a bigger question here that I think we're, we're all missing. Um, and the question that comes to my mind after reading the order is, what is our vision for the uh, Quarry Hills community and um, in the future? Um, you know, we're talking about, you know, 
putting more development up there and expanding it, there's a neighborhood up there. How is the neighborhood going to be um, included in this planning process? Has anybody thought about that? You know, um, you know, we talked about the trails and the fact that, you know, what, um, uh, friends of, Forbes, of Blue Hill says that they're there. I read in the paper the other day that they, that QHA says they're uh, one says they're there, one says there's not, they're not there. Well, why don't we go out there as a community, walk the site, and see if they're there? And if they're not, let's fix it. Fix it. <laughs> the play fields. Um, I have first hand experience of the play fields. I spent many, many years, six, seven years up there playing, um, watching my son play baseball. And I do. I, believe that there is something in the lease that says that QHA was supposed to maintain those fields. Well, we all know that they were not ma maintained. Besides mowing the lawns, um, there was very little visible um, field maintenance happening. And in fact, because I was one of the parents, I would come there early, fill all the holes in the field, in the batter's box, then they could play. So. Um, Storm drainage issues up at the up at the fields after rainstorms. Those fields were very muddy. I understand why. Um, it was a landfill. They capped it. They put dirt on top. It doesn't drain. So after um, rainstorms, um, a lot of our games got canceled for a day after because they couldn't play on those fields. Obviously, the fields were not properly designed. Um, to drain storm water. Let's fix it. Now's the time. Car access to the ball fields. And again, <laughs> um, to get to that field, there is a, a very skinny drive that goes up the hill. It's a very steep hill uh, incline, and it's slightly wider than one car wide. Um, yet it is used as a two way in and out of that parking lot. And um, at the top, there's kind of a blind turn into the parking lot, which is pretty dangerous. Um, the drive was never properly designed for two-way traffic. Um, and it poses a safety concern and a bottleneck up at the access to those fields. Let's fix it. Pedestrian access. There is no pedestrian access between um, the Rutucci Drive and the baseball fields. You come on the sidewalk, you have to walk up that same uh, treacherous, really steep drive to get up to the top to get to the baseball fields. Well, let's fix it, right? Traffic. M Mr. Walker mentioned this before. Um, often on Saturdays, right before games, we would have to, um, you know, build in another half hour into our schedule to get over that off ramp to get into Quarry Hills. Obviously, uh, it's not only a nuisance, it was a, it's a significant safety hazard. And I'm glad to hear that somebody is starting to think about it. Let's fix it. Um, my summary here is that Quarry Hills needs a master plan. There's all these issues. It could be awesome. It has the best view around. I'm up there a lot. I love it. However, it could be way, way better. And if you're considering um, putting more development up there besides the golf course, whatever, let's put together a master plan together um, as a community. Um, let's fix the trails. Let's fix the ball fields. And um, so in the long term, if the city desires to improve the quality of life in that neighborhood, by enhancing the valuable recreation, historic quarries, trails, open spaces, while entertaining potential expanding commercial development adjacent to the golf course, that it should be done in a holistic, integrated way <clears throat> to include um, addressing traffic and pedestrian safety and stewardship of the environment. Such planning efforts which could be undertaken by an urban planner, um, and it would be a great use of the COVID funds that we have. Let's take a step back. There's 20 years left to this current lease. 
what is the rush? Um, to summarize, smart development and a new visionary master plan is what's needed at Quarry Hills before the city should consider signing any extended lease with any developer. Thank you for your time. Good evening. My name is Jocelyn Sedney. I live at 85 Monroe Road in Quincy. I'm just uh, here to, to uh, sort of champion the Blue Hills. Blue Hills is a tremendous asset to Quincy. I'm an avid user of the Blue Hills. I'm interested in as many of my fellow citizens having access to the Blue Hills, whether they live in Quincy, whether they live in Milton. Um, I I'm concerned because I think that we've been talking a lot about dollars and cents. What happened in the past apparently has worked out really well. It's worked out well for the city in terms of dollars and cents, has worked out for the O'Connell family, I suppose, in terms of dollars and cents. People can be proud of the votes they made in the past. Mayors have done a good job. That's what they're all supposed to be doing for all of us. And what I'm suggesting at this point is that going forward, this city council has an obligation to read every word of this lease that is gonna go on and live beyond all of us and to be sure that that lease maximizes the benefits for all the citizens of Quincy. And I'm not just talking about money. Sure, money's gonna come back into the coffers and presumably it's gonna come back at the rate it's supposed to come back. And presumably there are provisions in the lease for periodic audits so that we're sure that we're getting what we're supposed to be getting for the citizens of Quincy. But there are other things that need to be considered here. You've heard a number of people talk about access to the Blue Hills and I, I suppose we're gonna hear something from the O'Connells about trails. I, I think that we heard. I, I don't know what that's going to be, but I would be very surprised if we didn't hear that they are also avid users of the Blue Hills and that they are anticipating in providing trail access, well-marked, well-maintained into the Blue Hills because we're all interested in the people of Quincy being able to have increased access to uh, the ability to hike with our families, to take walks with our, with our dogs, to do all those kinds of things in the outdoors, it does, may not bring in money, it might not bring in a penny to the city of Quincy, but it means a lot to the residents of Quincy to have access to those recreational activities. Sure, we're not swinging a golf course or, or golf club, but we're hiking, we want access. And we're not talking about opening up the whole property to, for access to the Blue Hills. A trail, a couple of trails, well marked, this, at last I checked, I think the golf course is advertised as being semi-private. Well, that means it's semi-public. So let's serve the public, not just in terms of dollars and cents that are gonna come back into the coffers of Quincy. And this is something that's gonna go on forever, beyond the lives of everybody here. Let's give access, not unfettered access, but access and have it written into the lease there are provisions that that access has to be provided, and if it's not, that there's a penalty clause, and there's a way to enforce that. And I sort of second all of the comments that have been made about the difficulty in getting information about this particular issue. I, I think that it's something that deserves a, a broader um, consideration, and really, look at that lease. I haven't read the lease. It's up to all of you to read every single word of that lease because it is going to have so much of an impact, not just in our lifetimes, but the lifetimes of other people. And to please try to not just congratulate people for what they've done well in the past, but look forward and say, okay, we have an obligation now to every citizen to get the most we can get for the citizens of Quincy in this lease, the most, not just dollars and cents, but the most we can get for every citizen of Quincy going forward. Thank you. Uh, folks, at this point, I'm gonna suspend the uh, public comment for a second so we can open up the regular meeting, then I'll be right back.
I'd like to call the, um, the regular city council meeting of Monday, November 14, 2022. It is now 733. Um, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Councilor Andronico. Present. Councilor Kane. Present. Councilor Harris. Present. Councilor Yang. Present. Council Mahoney. Present. Council McCarthy. Present. Councilor Phelan. Councilor DeBorna. Present. Seven members. Seven members. We have a quorum. <laughs> um, please stand if you can. I'd like to get a moment of silence. Please use it as you wish. Please turn to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Madam Clerk, please read the open meeting law. Pursuant to the open meeting law, any person may make an audio or video recording of this public meeting or may transmit the meeting through any medium. Attendees are therefore advised that such recordings or transmissions are being made, whether perceived or unperceived by those present and are deemed acknowledged and permissible. Thank you, Madam Clerk. We're going to recess and we're going to go back into our ordinance committee. Thank you. Uh, I'll open public comment up again, and uh, Mr. Rotorfield, you have the mic. Thank you. Um, John Rotorfield, 62 Renwall Road. Um, everyone who's spoken tonight has made great points. Um, I agree with just about everyone, so it's hard to make everyone happy. Um, I don't think involving um, planning will help at all. I've been to many, many planning meetings, not to do anything disrespect to Mr. Fatsies, but this is a private thing. Um, one of the greatest things in Quincy right now is the golf course. That is, you say, like, what's one of the coolest things in Quincy? It's the Grand Slink Golf Course. If someone comes into town and you want to take them to eat, to someplace cool to eat, you do take them to Granite Links. That's a very cool place. So when I was younger, I went to high school in the 80s. That was quarries. I went swimming in those quarries. I'm not sure if any of the counselors in front of me went in those quarries, but after those quarries, it was nothing. It was a barren land. So it was people would get rid of old cars and throw them away in the quarries, or people would go up swimming, and, you know, it was useless land, basically. Not like Quincy Center. Quincy Center used to be vibrant. Up there was useless. So they took something that was nothing, and they made it into something. So we've spent over a billion dollars in loans that we've borrowed to try to make the city better. What they're trying to do is they need this lease. I'm a little bit confused on if you're gonna add 99 to the 24. So technically, is there gonna be 124 years? I'm not sure if you're gonna end the 24 and start a new 99, um, but none of us are gonna be here in 99 years. A lot of us aren't gonna be here in 24 years. Um, one thing I think you gotta write into the provision because I go over the numbers all the time. If we, let's say, we're basically the landlords and they're the tenant, and we're gonna lease them that for 99 years. Well, what happens if the city of Quincy has to file for bankruptcy in 20 years? There needs to be a bankruptcy provision that's put into that because that could happen because we need revenue. So the revenue that we're gonna be losing from not getting every nickel and dime out of what they're doing up there, I don't really understand. I don't really understand why we're talking about all the, the walking trails that are up there because they're, you know, one thing I did read, I, I don't, I never remember anything about walking trails. Um, I've, I've never walked up there. Um, a couple things I don't understand. I don't understand why the city council or why the city approved to put the marijuana place up there. That was not a good idea. Um, I don't really think the ball fields were a good idea. Um, as you could see, the ball fields, that would maybe be a good place for some senior housing or something. Um, um, they took away ball fields that we used to have before. I mean, what if someone has to drive their bike or walk 
to go play baseball. You pretty much need parents that have a car, and that's not inclusive of everybody. So we want to be a city of being inclusive. I did notice on one of those flyers that we have that we're advertising these walking trails we have all throughout the city and stuff. But you can't advertise walking trails that go across a fairway or that are someone's going to get hit by a golf ball that's dangerous for people to go walking on. So one thing um, I'm going to say I agree with Mr. Zamzow. We're not trying to hide anything here. Um, the O'Connells have been in the city of Quincy forever. Um, Mr. Hannon, your dad was the mayor. I mean, so these people have been, these are, this is Quincy, these people. They developed without the revenue. Imagine if we didn't have the tax revenue down at Marina Bay. What would the tax rate be right now? Like $22 per thousand? So we need the new growth. We need a reason for people to want to come to the city of Quincy. So why are we doing this now? I don't know. A lot of stuff in Quincy doesn't make sense to me. I'm, you're, we're not allowed to go behind that row. You guys are there making all the decisions for us. We can elect officials twice a year. I wish we could have a mayor that was every two years instead of every four years. That's a mistake that I think we made a long time ago. But what we do have to do... Stay with the lease. Okay. So... Well, if, if you want to stay with the lease, one, well, problem, one have, problem I do have with the lease, I would appreciate with, in the future, whether it be next month, yeah. next year, or even five years from now, because I do plan on being around for all three of those terms, okay? Um, I would like the presentation, you know, like present to the public what the lease is and what's going on. Then let us make a public comment. How can I comment about a lease that I've never read? How can I comment about an LDA agreement that I don't see? I just got to make stuff up when I'm going. I don't, I don't prepare notes. I just know that the lack of information, it's hard to find. I don't, you know, it's wrong about giving us little bits of information um, in the Patriot Ledger, okay? You're not supposed to, be, people aren't supposed to be coming up here and say, hey, I read this in the Patriot Ledger because everything that's printed in the Patriot Ledger that does not mean that it's actually true. It just means that it was printed in the Patriot Ledger. I believe something more if it was printed in the Quincy Sun than I do if it was printed in the Patriot Ledger if it was about the lease, if we're talking about the lease. So um, in a total nutshell, I'm actually for this. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And, and, you know, and it's... You know, for everyone that's complaining about everything, there's been so many. I remember they gave Mayor Phelan a, um, a, a hard time about the Honeywell deal. Oh, he screwed up the Honeywell deal. He screwed up the Honeywell deal. There's been so many things that, you know, I wish the public would have came to speak about, you know, that we need help. We need people to get involved. So it is good that people are coming up here and they're speaking, but it's kind of like they're speaking against people that are actually helping the city. So that's why I'm a little bit confused. So I want everyone to be happy. I want Quincy to be a great place, and I want Quarry Hills to make sure you stop serving Heineken, because the last time <laughs> I was up there, there wasn't any Heineken, okay? And other than that, I'm for this with right. the Heineken Thanks, John. approval. Thank you. That's <clears throat> Steve, a hot act to follow. Uh, good evening. Good evening, council members. Uh, my name is Steve Perdios. I live at 86 Ruggle Street down in uh, beautiful Quincy Point. Um, so I, um, I have been spending a lot of time up at Quarry Hills for the last uh, eight years or so at the, at the um, <clears throat> pardon me, at the baseball fields. So I know a lot about that, <clears throat> pardon me, firsthand. Um, the problem with the ball fields didn't start in the last six months. It didn't start seven years ago. The problem with the ball fields have been up there for a long, long time. Uh, the, somebody had mentioned maintenance of the fields uh, being pretty much limited to the lawn mowing. I can. I can, uh, I can agree with that 100% and, and, and back that sentiment up. Um, you can't maintain a, a ball field once every 15 years. 
Uh, if we didn't have this issue come up, would we be talking about improving the ball fields there at all? Probably not. The drainage problem would continue. It would continue to exacerbate, and um, there's, there's a whole host of problems with the ball fields. It's a great facility. Um, we use it a lot. Um, I, I get having uh, all the fields in one location. There's a benefit to that, but there's a lot of systemic problems with it. Uh, this should be, uh, this should be a, a meeting just on those ball fields so that we can get a lot of public input on how to how to improve that. So I'm glad to hear that there's going to be some um, improvement to the ball fields, but if the next improvement to the ball fields after whatever happens is 99 years out, that's not going to work because things are going to break down between day one and, and year 99. So there needs to be something more than just mowing the lawn. Okay, so I'm glad that the ball fields is, is in is in the mix, that's great news. Um, the topic of the traffic getting into Rashuti Drive being horrendous, I've kind of lived through that, it's, it's terrible, and I'm glad to hear that that's being addressed as well. I would, um, I would ask the council to make both of those issues uh, a, a condition on, the, on any type of lease agreement going forward uh, and, and something that's locked in. And so what I, what I really wanted to come here tonight to advocate for are really the walking trails. We have a situation where we have um, one person saying it's fine, one person saying it's, it's not fine, and there's an argument about it. Um, my family uses the Blue Hills a lot. We love the Blue Hills. It's, it's fantastic. Um, many of you know I, use, I try to get to all the open spaces around Quincy. I think we get a lot of great, great open space in Quincy, and the Blue Hills is very, very important in that, in that mix. So um, I, I think it was Ann, I think, that mentioned, uh, let's go up. Let's go find out. Let's have a site visit. Let's have a city council meeting up at Quarry Hills, and let's walk the trails and find out where they are. We have, we have you know, we, we can both, we can take a piece of paper and dump some ink on it and fold it in half and open it up, and you'll say it says one thing, and I'll say it looks like something else. Uh, we have somebody saying, yeah, there's walking trails, and somebody saying, well, there isn't, and this is not a new argument. This has been going on for 15 years. Uh, this argument about the trails aren't done, the, where are the trails, what's going on? So please don't agree to anything until you have ferreted that question out and we can put it to rest because it's been a long, tedious argument about the walking trails. Uh, they're supposed to be there. Uh, they're supposed to be obvious and well accessed and it would be a benefit to everybody from all elements of the city, not just up in the North Quincy area, but from all uh, walks of life around Quincy. So please make that uh, a, a, a high priority before you uh, make a vote on this. So thanks very much. Appreciate the time. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Okay, I'll close that portion uh, of the uh, public comment. Uh, what I'd like to do now is uh, open it up uh, to committee members. Uh, for questions, Mr. Timmons is here, uh, members of Quarry Hills, mm -hmm. Mr. Walker, of course, will uh, open for any questions. Um, Councilor Mahoney. If you'll indulge me, um, Chairman, I just wanted to mention that um, Barbara Dolan, who is also the chairperson of Quarry Hills, am I the wrong one? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I wanted to be Brian Pamucci tonight, so. Um, if you'll indulge me, Barbara Dolan, um, who was also the chairperson of the Quarry Hills Advisory Board, she was not able to make the meetings this evening. It was um, really last minute, and um, they, have some, um, they have some issues that they weren't able to make it tonight. But Brian Pamucci did have a meeting back in September 9-8 of 22, where they were told that there would be many more meetings in regards to what was going to be happening or potentially happening up at, um, at, at Granite Links, Quarry Hills. Um, as an abutter, she believes that these meetings should be taking place before any decision for a magnitude in regarding an, a 99-year lease because of the impact of the neighbor's traffic and city decisions that are being made for quality of life. And I just wanted to mention that because she was not able to make it, and she is part of the Quarry Hills Advisory Board. I'm not sure um, if we're incorporating them. I would love to say as a city councilor that, you know, this is the, and I too, enjoy myself when I come to Cor to Cor Hills at Grant Lakes. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm very impressed with the, the scenery, the sights, everything that we do. Um, it's a little loud sometimes in my neighborhood because I can hear it. I'm, I'm actually pretty far away from it, but I can enjoy the music for a little while too. But, but that's okay. I mean, I, I, I'm not here to say that we don't have a beautiful um, 27 golf course, the whole golf course. It's, it is beautiful. But this is a different course of action that we're talking about. And when this meeting happened back in September, I was not able to attend. But I was told from the people who did attend that they felt, 
like this was the, the start of a conversation. And now people are feeling like, you know, this 99 year lease is being be put before us and there seems to be a rush for the lease, but the conversation isn't happening. So, and many people who came up here tonight were expressing that same thing. And, you know, as a city councilor, what I would have hoped to have had before even talking about any of this is maybe an audit of the monies that did come in. So we don't know the monies that came in. We, were in the, we, we read it once again in the newspaper. Um, I must say that I do agree with John Rodefell. Reading the newspaper is where I get most of my information. $4.5 million has come in. When I spoke with um, the auditor today, I was um, told how the money was coming in 10% goes to, 10% um, goes to, I believe, the fields. I'm not sure, does that mean the city of Quincy is maintaining the fields? I'm not sure, we don't do an audit of that. But then also um, goes into Quarry Hills. Another 50% another goes into the DPW for um, design and repairs or maintenance or, or purchases of equipment. I'm not sure if that's going for the purchase of equipment that's happening up at Quarry Hills or is that happening throughout the whole city? So we should be auditing that. We should be taking a look at that and making sure that we understand the process of how we're being able to collect that. Who's looking at that from the Granite Links or Quarry Hills Association to be able to make sure that we're collecting the right amount? I'm not suggesting by any means that you're cooking your books or anything, but I'm just saying that as a counselor, I want to be able to see that transparency, that process to which we're being able to see those things happen, especially when we're discussing a 99-year lease. So that would be something that I think that this, this committee needs to be able to review and understand. I think back in 2009, there was an amendment to the lease where 40% of the revenues that was coming in, which was originally going someplace else, is now going into the revenue account. In 2009, we were hit with the recession, so this is the area when you say, what happens when Quincy doesn't have enough money to be able to pay the things that they need? How do we readdress that money? And, was that 40% that we were having before going into maybe taking care of the fields or something else? I'm not sure. I wasn't here. I wasn't on the council at that time. I wasn't on the council or even when, when, when Granite Links was created. Um, but it's, but, or, or maybe even paying attention to city politics at that point. But, but what I'm trying to say is that this is an opportunity. You know, there's a 99-year lease in front of us today. It seems to be in front of us with public meetings happening. We don't have a ward four counselor. That's another thing that we have here that we're missing. You know, there's gonna be a special election for a ward four counselor. So the ward four community does not have a voice. And that is a huge concern. I, I live in ward four, but it's, it's a big concern. You know, there's a void. We're missing somebody here tonight. They had a meeting on September 8th. They promised more meetings, but we're not having those. Maybe there would have been more you know, I, I congratulate um, Judge Palmucci, but you know that's something that we're missing here tonight. Um, and again, like, are there trails or not? There are no trails. I mean, I got everybody in the city council got all of those emails, and you know, reading in the paper, it's like, no, we don't have to have the trails. The state said we didn't have to have them, but then there are trails. I know we've walked up up there, and there are kind of trails you can get to. I'm not sure if they're legit trails, but you can kind of weave your way through the woods. But they're not maintained trails. So I think that would be really beneficial if we all did go on a field trip to kind of walk through the woods to see the trails. Dave, Council McCarthy is loving that idea. But I think that it, that would be very, very, very beneficial. So, I mean, I, I appreciate the, the um, public forum tonight, but I can't tell you how many people who reached out to me who said that they didn't know that there was a public forum tonight. And it was, I think it was because of Veterans Day. There was, it was, it was, people just didn't know about it. So I think more people would have been here had they known and, you know, and the presentation, I think the missed opportunity was that, you know, we could have gone back and taken a look at maybe what we have done over the course of the 50 years, the successes that we had to really present it and explain it to the general public as to what has happened, what was, what did we expect was going to happen in that 50 year lease. We have 22 years left. Is this, I do have the same question, is this, you know, is this 22 plus a 99 year lease or is it 99 years? If we sign it tomorrow, we'll be 99 years going forward. And, you know, why are we doing 99 years? What, what's the, I mean, I know the benefit of 99 years, but we did a 50-year lease first. Why would we not do another 50-year lease? Is there a reason for that, that Granite Links, to be able to accomplish some of the things that you want to do? Is that, is that the reason? So we need to understand that and to be able to, under, to understand whether or not we're doing the right things for our constituents here in Quincy. I know that this is not really one question, Dave, but there's just so much that needs to be unpacked with what we're talking about here tonight. I see this as multiple meetings and potentially community meetings and many more public opportunities. But to go back to Barbara Dolan, who's part of the Quincy Hills Advisory Board, I'm not even sure. I, I, she says that it's still, it's still around and there's been no communication. So I'm not sure who's on that advisory board, but it might be important for the city council to understand who's on that advisory board. Um, 
I don't see, I don't know if that board's, uh, I was on that board 20 years ago. <laughs> well, Barbara seems to think that the board has not dissolved. So on it, so. I guess. Yeah, so, so, so I think that might be an important thing that before we start talking about another potential long-term lease, we should probably maybe consider how we put the parameters together to discuss some of the community efforts. What does the community want and right. how we can and, move and that tonight, together? Tonight, I spoke with Mr. Walker and the administration. You know, we're going to absorb mm -hmm. the comments, um, you know, before we take a vote or anything. No, I appreciate and, that. And I, like Steve brought up the baseball fields and the access and some of the some of the things that that will be tweaked in the lease. So uh, yeah. we'll get all our, our, our uh, discussion in tonight. We'll no, come back again. I appreciate that. I just and and, and to finish up, you know, as a parent of uh, of of children who did use the um, the soccer fields. I mean, there's, there's so many people who have used those soccer fields. Besides the point of not being able to ever allow your child to walk to the soccer fields because you did have to drive, so you had to actually add another 45 minutes in your day to go to the soccer fields. When you did get up there, um, you know, the 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 people who were running the soccer groups would have to either rent generators to put lights up there or they would park around in circles with their lights on so that kids could play soccer because the field it would get darker so these are things that you know we, maybe as we get the community input we might be able to figure out ways that we can improve these things as a whole that could benefit not only again our city but our community and in tying into those things so um, there's so many other questions that I'd have like what would this is one question I'm sure we're not going to get an answer but again you know can this be sold? We have a 99-year lease with this association. Is this something that potentially, if down the road, could this could could this lease be sold to another owner of the golf course? And how does that work? Or does that change the lease? Um, or in a situation like Burnsbrook Golf Course, where we had a lease and they ran into some problems, and the city ended up financially helping Burnsbrook Golf Course and then eventually taking over. I don't think we could do half the job. I don't think that's your goal because I don't think we would do a good job. But but you know that's those are the kind of questions that we do have to take into consideration. So. With all that, there's so many things that, there's just so many touch points that we have to kind of go back and look at to be able to figure out, is this the best um, possible move for the city? And I'm not saying it's not, but it's something that we should be discussing so that we can be fully transparent to the taxpayers as to what they can expect. Because obviously in the first 50 years, there were some expectations. We were gonna get trails, we didn't get trails. There's some confusion as to whether or not we have trails. So those types of things. And I have one other question for, um, Mr. Walker, I don't know when you said, if you could just explain, the, and I, I know it's in the lease, but if you could just explain for the general audience that's out there, uh, the fees, you said 10% of the, was it gross or net, 10% of the gross for golf fees? It's actually <laughs> both, Councilor. Okay. One is 10% gross of all golf-related revenue. That's rounds of golf, driving range, anything related to the activity of golf. Hmm. The other piece is 10% net of all other activities okay. generated by the facilities. That's the function facility, the, the restaurant, uh, beer, alcohol, those sorts of things. And then there was one, there was one other thing that somebody had mentioned to me, and, and it, was a re, it was regards to Quincy High School and North Quincy High School access um, for students to be able to play up there. I know that Fernsburg Golf Course has been <coughs> exceptionally well to the kids, our, our kids who are playing, but um, from what I understand from Quincy High School and North Quincy High School, they told me that it continues to be a struggle for the high school side to get golf access. Um, and, and they said it was part of the old lease, but I think that's something that we wanted to take into consideration too. I'm, but again, I'm not suggesting that you're not doing it. It's stuff that people are telling us, but I think if we put all these things out on the table and we really take a look at it, there's gonna be a way that we can put our, you know, put the best package together that will, that will be able to hopefully help everybody. But I, I can tell you as a West Quincy resident, and Rashuti Drive and the access off of the highway. And I know, Mr. Walker, you said that, you, that we're working with the state to resolve that. Without that being resolved, I'd say nothing should be able to happen. Not, not a 99 year lease, not a 50 year lease, not a five year, even the 22 year lease I'm concerned with because it is so dangerous. You can't go, you can't get across at all over there. If you go to the UPS store, never mind go up to where you guys are located, you can't get back out. So I, I, it's just, it's extremely dangerous. And you know that was done when they put that ramp, and I believe it was put in originally. They did update it again, but I think it was put in because of the, 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 the dirt coming in from downtown, and it hasn't been updated. That's certainly something that we need to work better with the state on, but until those two things are worked on and combined effort to be able to see a real, we shouldn't be discussing, we shouldn't be approving at least to go into the state until we have that figured out. 
that's just my personal opinion, but I do also think that there's so many things that we have to talk about before we'll even get to that point to be able to send this into the, into the, to, to get to an approval point. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Uh, Councilor Yang. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I was six when this was first discussed, and so I, uh, you know, was obviously not around to be, yeah, I was six, I know, I'm dating. Anthony's now younger than I am, though, so I'm not, I don't feel like the youngest one on the council anymore, but honestly, to be able to um, then use and access this space as an adult, right, my cousin got married up there, um, I've held functions up there, I've been to functions up there, um, I drive very frequently to the UPS store um, to return a bunch of Amazon stuff, and um, I love using also the walking paths and even just the driving paths in the area, it's absolutely amazing, so I just, um, I appreciate the weight of this conversation being here just because, again, when it was first discussed, I was so young and now, um, again, being able to enjoy the benefits of the area and now being in the space where, um, you know, I'm one of nine voices to, or eight voices to decide what happens in the future for future people, right, uh, like myself, it's, I just appreciate the weight of it and um, I just want to thank everyone for coming out and speaking on this. Again, my, my sentiment and from what I've heard from folks here this evening and from folks um, in the last few weeks since this was first introduced to the council is... My general takeaway and understanding of it is that it, no one's at a no. It's a, hey, I just have some more questions and I want to be engaged in the process. And so I do appreciate this opportunity to do that tonight. Um, to that end, uh, Solicitor Timmons, I know that you're here to answer some questions if possible. So I just have a few if you can clarify since we are here this evening. Right, is he here? To, okay, great. And if you can't, again, I know that this isn't the last meeting, so we can always come back and I know get answers um, in the future. So the first one I have uh, for clarifying issues, what was the, the term of the, um, the prior lease? It was 50 years? I, I'm sorry about this, and this is a complaint I've been making to Madam Clerk more frequently of late. I can't hear. It, I talk really said. fast and really quietly, and so a, I'll, I'll... That's a common complaint of people who come to the podium that they can't hear. And I've noticed people straining back there. I know I have a documented hearing issue, but I really think we need to do something about, and I'll raise it during this meeting in public. And this is no disrespect to Madam Clerk because she has worked with me on more than one occasion on this and we've tried to come up with something. But I, I'd like to see it made a priority. I think it'd be helpful. If you look where the speakers are in the chamber, they have no relation to human hearing. And so people have been back there straining, I've been straining, and I'm standing right here having trouble hearing you. So if you could speak up a little bit, you said something about the term of the prior one? Prior existing, I guess, right? The right now, the, yeah, it's yeah, 50 years. Yeah, the 04 years. is a 30 year. And um, in 97, let me just, I'll go back over all of them. The amended and restated was, which is the O, I beg your pardon, O2 amendment. Um, actually, I beg your pardon, that was for a term of 50 years in 2002, the amended and restated. In 97, which is the, uh, the original lease, and in 97, as Mr. Walker pointed out during his presentation, that was, actually termed a development agreement because at the time, you know, we were trying to cap a dump. Um, so the, the term in 97, I'll be one minute. Do you know the term in 90, the original lease? Beg your pardon? So they were both 50. Okay. Okay, but as it stands right now, where the lease is going to expire in 2052 then, right? The current lease? Uh, yes, that's correct. Okay, and so if, I'm just thinking, I'm saying for time's sake, we're not voting on this tonight. If it were voted on in 2022 and passed in 2022, is it 99 years on top of the two, like the 2022 time frame, or on top of what's still remaining? That's correct. Okay. Okay. Um, and then the other the, questions. The point Go of ahead, this sorry. was to draw up a, a new agreement. In '97, it was a, a, a major project, and 
It was revisited by then Mayor Fallon in 02 because we now had a golf course and we could see what was going to happen. So it was based on the current climate in 02. Uh, we're revisiting it at this point because we've seen how that golf course has worked over the past two decades and because the operator has some plans for how to work with um, trends in the golf industry and what's happened at the course itself. Okay. Um, I don't know if you're the one to answer my next few questions um, or three, but, you know, again, if he can't, then we can always carry it through to the next meeting. Um, Mr. Walk had mentioned earlier that there is going to be the traffic assessment that's going to be addressed from DOT. Now, I know that we have a good relationship with the state. Do we have an idea of timeline for um, certain points of is sort of just checking to see that we're moving in that direction? So whether it's, you know, them giving us an updated assessment or doing a traffic study or funding, like, do you know what I mean? Like, what are the points that we're trying to hit so that we know that there is going to be work and that we all, you know, can expect what's to come with the improvements? That's one for Mr. Walker, I okay. believe. Yeah, th th three to Mr. Chairman. Um, my knowledge on that project is that it's beyond the assessment, it's beyond the initial planning phase, that it's in the meat of design and engineering right now. Um, and when it reaches a certain point, as you know, Councillor, you go through 25, 50, 75% on the state design program. Um, when it reaches a certain point, that'll be the, the point of which we can bring it back to the public for comments, and that then triggers the next piece of the process. Mm -hmm. So we're right in the middle of it. I mean, this is a project that is on DOT's list. It's not just a, a dream or a, a vision at this point. It's on the list. Um, we're working through that design process right now. Um, and I would say in the very near term, we're gonna have something to show the public and begin the, the, that comment period and then take it to the next level, the construction level. Mm -hmm. But they haven't given you a sense of um, within the fiscal year or, you know, I this is, hey, this is yeah, going to Yeah, I mean, I expect that to be months, not years. I see, okay. That we'll be ready to, to show something. Okay. Um, the other question I have is about the footpaths. You mentioned that is now something that we need to talk to DEP about. So I, I'm trying to just also, because when I go, I just sort of park wherever I can park and just walk, right? Like I don't look at my Google Maps to see where I am. And um, similarly, sort of like looking at this and not actually standing there, I'm, I'm a little bit confused. And so I apologize. Could, is there somebody that can just clarify for me what is being considered, if at all, or w where exactly the issues are. I just, I, I feel as I don't have like a full understanding, and I want to have a full understanding for this conversation. Through you, Mr. Chairman, I'd, I'd ask Mr. O'Connell to address that specifically. Uh, just to back up, I'm sorry. Thank you, by the way, I'm looking forward to your presentation. But when you gave the history of how we got here, Mr. Walker, that's essentially what I'm looking for in detail for the, the walking paths, right? Like, where did it start? How was it part of the negotiations? Where are we now? And then sort of what's the future for it? Mr. Chairman, Councilors, thank you very much for considering this matter. So the question is hiking trails? Yes, or the footpaths, right? Like the, the, the sort of, I think, overarching concerns that I've heard from folks here this evening and folks who've called and emailed our traffic and the, the, the walking, the footpaths, or the walking trails, whatever you want to call them. First of all, I wanted to say that I agree with so very much of what was said here. There's, there's lots of questions and there should be many, many discussions. But as it relates to the hiking trails, when I first got involved with Granite Links approximately 15 years ago, I first approached the DEP to try to clear up any of the outstanding items. There were numerous uh, wetlands that needed to be dealt with, uh, landfills that needed to be closed. There were the hiking trails issues that needed to be resolved. And I can say, with absolute certainty that we were in compliance then and we continue to be in compliance now. So I know there's all kinds of people saying there are no hiking trails. I believe what they're saying is there are no hiking trails as they would like them to be across the golf course. We are in compliance with DCR. This map was the final piece of that process. It was accepted. Be happy to meet anyone up there. I understand, Mr. Chairman, that we might be having a field trip. Um, would love to walk those trails. If increased signage is a request, we'd be happy to work with friends on that. But these trails do exist, they have been built, they can be walked now, and the kids often vandalize and steal the signs. That's life. We would be happy to replace any signs that are missing, we'd be happy to enhance the signage if that would be helpful. 
Okay. Uh, could you just, uh, just, are you looking at the same, you're looking at the same map, right, yeah. that you have in front of you? Could you, uh, so the yellow, I was trying to read through the lease as well. I got halfway through it, so. Uh, but there was a section in the lease that did talk about the, the trails and said that it was highlighted in yellow. So what am I looking at with the yellow um, on this end, on the, on the, the far left-hand side of the page? Um, what's marked in yellow right now, but then there's some, it almost looks like from the aerial view. Like, so on the, on the left side of your map, right, and I'm sorry, because this is like so far and so small from you, it looks like almost um, where it says gas company access road hiking. I think this is hiking trail. God, that's why we hiking need our glasses. I know. Um, it looks like at the end of that that there's almost like a clearing that looks like a trail too, but that's not a part of this, right? So again, that's why I'm just, I feel like I'm not completely understanding here. That, do, you see, do you see what I'm talking about? I mean, It's yellow, so small from here. I'm sorry. Yellow dotted trails are the trails that were agreed to would be created, were created, and DCR ended up walking the trails and signing off on this plan. Okay, and so if there is any other trail that's not marked here, it's not actually like a public paved, you know, marked trail, correct? We can certainly maintain any of the trails that are on the Quarry Hills leased property. Um, DCR doesn't look favorably upon anyone cutting new trails or maintaining trails that are existing. I'd be happy to work with them if that would be helpful to the process, but basically this is the plan that brought an end to the Section 61 findings on the matter of hiking trails. This is compliance. So literally, I've been there for 15 years and this is the first time I've heard any issues about the hiking trails. So... <clears throat> Okay, um, and I guess the last question I have just for tonight then, and I'd have to, I wanna finish going through the lease and see, I know that earlier Mr. Rocky had mentioned that this is, um, or maybe you did, Mr. Chairman, that this is a conversation um, about our, about putting a home rule, in, a home rule petition in and not necessarily discussing the lease itself, um, but I love reading through leases and I just am asking and wondering if there is an opportunity to discuss um, any items within the lease, like you said, if there's more signage, and that's something that we can always, you know, sort of expect moving forward, or just, you know, is there is there an opportunity for us to have, I think, productive conversation and collaborative dialogue with the lease itself? Here, I see. Uh, well, there's going to be know, yeah. continued conversations and, and more meetings. I certainly want to address any concerns about the ball fields. You know, they should be draining properly, they should be maintained, so uh, absolutely, it's a conversation that will continue. Okay, and um, I just want to... Sure, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, just to clarify a little bit, because I think I was the one who said a Counselor, that the order before the body is the home rule petition mm -hmm. that authorizes the city to enter into the lease. And by no means was I trying to suggest that this body, the members of the public or anyone else, wouldn't have the ability to weigh in ask questions, comment, offer suggestions to the body of the lease itself, of course. Yeah, okay, cool, thank you. Um, it's the last thing I wanna say in this is I think um, more of a statement and maybe a question of opinion, but um, you know, taking a look at this and again, reading through the lease as much as I've gotten through it and hearing the conversations tonight, um, I think leasing it for 99 years, yes, it's a long time. Um, I feel though hesitant to entertain a sale only because if and when the lease ends, and there are some termination agreements that I have seen in here from what I've read so far, the land then always will come back to us, uh, right? Even if I'm not the one sitting here 99 years, right? That if we sell the land, I mean, that's it, it's gone. And yes, the, the tax dollars would be incredible and consistent, right? If and when until, God forbid, something happens to the business, right? Or it gets sold, and as a private owner of the land, you can sell it to somebody else who now privately owns the land, right? And we have a lot less I think, um, control over that conversation. And so again, this was meant to be more, I think, of a statement, but also if folks have any um, thoughts on the opinion solicitor or Mr. Walker on this, I think that, you know, just the thought of, okay, yes, this is a very long-term lease, again, that will outlive me. However, at the end of it, knowing that there are termination agreements within the 99 years, if something, you know, goes away that doesn't, I think, favor either party, um, or at the end of the 99 years, whoever is sitting here can have another discussion about what to do with that property. I prefer it that way. Um, I like it when Quincy has control over our properties. And so th those are my thoughts on it. Um, there's a lot that, again, I still want to come back with, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate that 
we have room for more dialogue. I think that the lease is quite extensive, and um, I look forward to continuing to talk to you all about it. I did want to just state that no one from Quarry Hills has ever suggested ownership be transferred over. I think that this is an amazing success story, and we're trying to just continue that story. And a lot of people are questioning whether or not there's a master plan. There's 50 or 100 great ideas about how Granite Link should be re reconfigured. The process doesn't start with the master plan. The process starts with long-term site control. So really, this is the first step, which would allow us to take a step back and reevaluate parking and reevaluate should we have a hotel up there, reevaluate should we be expanding the restaurant, should the pro shop be at the top of the hill. There's a hundred ideas that this team has, and they're all very expensive, and they will be financed over a long period of time, and that's what this is about. So if we don't have that term, we don't act as if we are the long-term leasehold. It, it's just one of those fundamentals of finance. So I think uh, Mr. Walker said it best. It really is about significant capital improvements requiring long-term leases. No, I agree. And, and look, I just think that it's like I said at the beginning of this conversation, right? From what I've heard tonight and from what I've heard from other folks who've reached out before this evening, it's a matter of just being you know, being heard and being part of the process, right? I mean, they're here, you all are here. I know you all, you know, on both sides of the sort of aisle here, right? Um, I mean, I shouldn't say it like that, but um, <laughs> what I mean to say is that you're all from Quincy, you all are passionate about Quincy, what happens with the future of this property. Um, take the opportunity tonight to talk with one another, right? I think that my sentiment, and I'm, I'm happy that we got, to, we got to hear from you as well, um, I really feel as though this is a matter of just wanting to get together and collaborate on what the future of the site is, right? We have REITs benefits from it, full stop, right? And so if we're going to move forward with it, um, why not continue to have open dialogue? And it sounds like you all are open to that, so I appreciate that. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilor. Uh, Councilor DeMona. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, can you hear me? You got me off? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Oh, there, there it is. Can you hear me, Mr. Timmons? <laughs> I'm going to talk a little bit later about what you talked about and what will pertain to Quarry Hills tonight in this particular ordinance committee. Um, thank you. Um, um, I did attend the September 8th meeting up at Quarry Hills with Councilor Palmucci, now Judge Palmucci. Um, I think some of the biggest items that were in that um, discussion was um, the intersection down at the bottom. I mean, that was pressing on every person that was in there. I mean, Grant, Granite Link's employees, to residents that live in the Rashuti Drive area, to people like Steve and myself that go up there for the baseball games. Um, I was coaching my kid at Junior Farm, nine-year-olds up at Quarry Hills. His game's at 545, so there's really um, a long line of traffic going underneath the bridge at Curry Hardware getting through. And at that time, it's rush hour, so it's very difficult getting across there. Um, I think the biggest issue that was in that room on September 8th was not only a long-term fix, but a short-term fix, something that we can get after now, um, tomorrow, um, in the design phase now. And then if we have more solutions and we try something, maybe we can get a long-term fix um, that's just my what I've heard in the room, what my personal opinion is about. If, if folks see some action, um, I think it's going to benefit uh, folks coming into the area. It's going to um, also allow more visitors to come in instead of bypassing it. And um, I think it's going to be really beneficial for the, for the residents in that area, Rashuti Drive. Um, a long-term fix is considering the UPS store, maybe even taking that and adding some area in there to allow some, some bypass. Um, I think another long-term fix, as crazy as it sounds, is uh, a possible bridge um, that goes over. Um, if you're gonna make a big, huge investment, um, you gotta consider all the options. Um, that's a long-term fix, it should be considered. Um, I believe that Quarry Hills is one of the best attractions in the whole city of Quincy. Uh, I attended a wedding over the summer and it was a beautiful wedding. Um, but the problem was is a lot of the people at the wedding wanted to stay up there 
and enjoy enjoy that 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 scene. And they weren't able to stay like a hotel overnight in that particular area. They had to go elsewhere. But um, I hope that's the vision. I think that's a beautiful vision. I think it'd be an unbelievable attraction for the future. Um, I think it'll be a good tax base for for the city. Um, but you have to look at public safety as number one criteria for this. And that intersection, that crossing down at the bottom of that hill is a terrible, terrible um, way. Um, it's angled where it goes this, the, I guess it's almost like a 45 where it should be almost a 90 and it's very dangerous. So um, I know we're in the mass DOT stages, but that has to be, in my opinion, speed tracked and, and taken care of as a short term fix. Um, I hope by the time we get to the baseball games this summer that something, some type of action has, has occurred. Um, whether it needs all stakeholders, whether it be everybody up there at the uh, Granite Links, the city of Quincy, Mass DOT to sit down and say, what can we do um, right now? Um, so I'm speaking on behalf of the, the residents that live in that, sit, that particular area, speaking on behalf of the visitors that are there on, on a daily basis. Um, as I was, um, and I don't want to make a wrench in this, but as I was leaving the Good Scout breakfast the other day, I was coming down the hill, and there was a vehicle sitting up on top of the island in an accident. So, um, you know, weather conditions can change a lot of things up there as well with wet, wet surfaces, snow, obviously. Um, and I, I just want to see everybody benefit from, from that crossing. Um, really, my main items, I'm glad that the trails have been discussed here tonight. Uh, I know that's very important. I've talked to the, to, to the group over here about possibly getting some signage up. If, they, if they're vandalized or missing. Um, so I hope that that's into consideration. Um, we're, we're all trying to work together here. Um, I, I think this was a good discussion tonight. It was a good start. I attended the meeting. I wanted to see what was, was, was talked about. Um, obviously, Council Balmucci, in his absence of Ward 4, um, he, he, did, he did get the information out to the abutters to make sure that they were there. And they, I did see a, a, good, a good group of Rashuti Drive residents in the, in the, in the meeting that night. And, um, you know, I, I just hope that, that some type of action is done at that crossing. I mean, that's, that's one of the major um, particular areas of the city um, that needs to be mitigated. So, um, I mean, I'm not going to put it towards, towards any of the, the, the lease conditions, but it's something that's on my mind. Um, as I was leaving that meeting that night, I says, you know, I got, I know Council Pamuch is going to be leaving, become a judge, and he was, that I'm going to speak about getting that cross crossing uh, mitigated right away. And I know a long-term fix might cost a little bit more financially, but we can definitely do something in the short term to alleviate <coughs> and get some action done on that bottom of that crossing. So um, I think all the answers and all the questions have been asked by my colleagues. I just want to make sure that you know we're all on the same page with that crossing. I think it, it'll also benefit all of you, uh, and we all know that. Um, and, and I want to make sure that everybody at the table, all the stakeholders, get a chance to uh, to weigh in on that and get that speed track. So that that'll be my my top priority for for this particular um, um, vote. So thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilor. Um, I'll just I'll wrap it up a little bit. Um, I love the idea, uh, Mr. O'Connell, of uh, possibly working with Judy and the Blue Hills folks to come up on a Saturday or maybe a late Saturday to take a little hike or take a little, you know, peek. You know, whatever day is good, we don't get hit by golf balls. But um, uh, I'd be open to that because uh, what you guys have done, the Hannons and the O'Connells, um, I, I said earlier, I, I was on that advisory board. Mayor Phelan put me on in 2002. Um, Councillor uh, Brian Conley appointed me on there. When we first started, there were 80 people on. There were people coming out of the woodwork because number one, it was the dump was going away, and number two, it was golf. Uh, it dwindled down to the local folks in the Rashuti Drive area, but it was a good board, and. Um, I also worked for a landscaper in Milton for a number of years, so I was in that that dump a lot in the in the back road there, um, uh, in on the Milton side. And and for what it's transformed, every time I get to that point, when I'm trying to find my ball in the woods, 
up there, I, I start to laugh because, uh, you know, it was miles and miles of trash. And um, Walter uh, Jr., uh, his dad and I would always have long conversations, but one of the lines, and I, I mention it all the time, was to one of the uh, abutters in Milton as it was going down, and everybody was kind of complaining back then, also it's a dump, you're going to turn it over, it smells, everything else, but Walter Sr. had that comment of, well, if you give us some time, there won't be seagulls flying over your house, there'll be golf balls. And that's on hole six on the Milton side. And, uh, and it's just magnificent. To work in a way, um, you know, for the existing trails, you know, signage, or, and go up with the Blue Hills group to take a look. Um, at, I'm, I'm, I'm wide open to suggestions. I know the administration is also. Uh, all the points, uh, you know, the fields went in. I went up there when the fields were brand new, and, and you know, being capped, we had difficulties for the longest time. There weren't lights up there. Uh, there was a battle on that with the cap and everything else. Um, you know, the, the entrance in, uh, coming up off of Rashuti Drive, and then, and then the exit, too. I know these are all things that can be tweaked and, and taken care of. And, and uh, just FYI for the counselors, there are... 45 trails up in the Blue Hills right now and 125 miles of, of trails up there. So, um, you know, this just, I don't know if this is included in that number. That's a pretty big number. So, and Blue Hills, as uh, Mr. Perdio said, is, um, is, is, is very, is, it's used often by, uh, by everybody in the surrounding area. I also received, just for the record, uh, the written communications that will all go into the record. And I received a lot of emails from folks in the Blue Hills and concerned constituents, pretty much the same. I mean, this group here kind of um, capsulated the, the issues um, of, of, the, um, of the trails and some of the concerns. And I, I think the administration and, and the council along with Quarry Hills and the, and the residents can work it out. So um, we'll uh, keep this in the ordinance committee. We'll I'll hook up with you, Mr. O'Connell. We'll talk, and we'll, I'll talk to Judy and whoever the lead person is, and we'll put something together sooner than later and uh, get up there before it gets cold and, uh, and take, a, take a, a walk around and talk because it's, it's, it's just a, a big positive. Uh, John Rotorfield went on and on, and at the end, um, you know, he nailed it. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's just a big plus, a big positive for Quincy. So with that, I will um, adjourn the... Uh, the meeting and we'll go to the full council meeting. Thank you very much, folks. Thank you guys for being here. We are, we are back into session for the regular city council meeting. Uh, Madam Clerk, first item on the agenda. Number one, traffic parking, alarm and lighting, TPAL update, Director Edward Grenning, Jr. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Before we get started, I just want to um, let the councilors know we're, we're going to be installing um, Rule 10, which is each member will be allowed up to 15 minutes uh, for the first round, and then for the second round, everyone will get five minutes. And before we open it up to Director uh, Grennan from the TPAL, the Traffic Parking Alarm and Lighting Division, which is fantastic. Um, this is our third set of series. Um, we've had uh, DPW Commissioner Al Gracioso in here, and we've had Dave Murphy of the Natural Resources in here, and now um, Director Grennan will be in here for our third series um, in front of the City Council here tonight. So with that, Director Grennan, you have the floor. Councilor, Councilors, President DeBono, thanks very much for the opportunity to present to you tonight. Uh, with me is Traffic Engineer Allison Rule. I know you all are familiar with her and her wonderful work. So we want to just give you a rundown of things that we have going on in the department. We don't currently have any um, bonded capital money, but we do have a uh, number of initiatives and projects that we're working on that we're excited to share with you today. So we're going to kind of break it up into four categories of project and initiative, safety, capacity, bicycle, and transit. To start with safety, um, a good way to start here is that we have, as a department and in collaboration with a lot of other city departments and stakeholders, created the city's first transportation safety action plan. 
And what that is is a uh, basically a playbook for strategies and um, a master plan to look at uh, some deficiencies we have in the city and how to tackle those. So um, the, the plan creates a, a playbook to move towards the goal of zero serious injury and fatality crashes by 2040. That is an ambitious goal, but it's one we think we can meet. The process of this was the, a, a deep look at the crash history over the last five years, which would have been years 2017 to 2021, was looked at um, with an emphasis on fatal crashes, serious injury crashes, uh, particularly those that involve bikes or pedestrians. I think it's important to point out this is something that municipalities all over the country are getting in order. Um, it is going to be a major key to unlock federal money um, that is coming out. The transportation bill, as we all know, has a great opportunity with funds, and uh, this is a, a gateway to those monies. As I said, we did a f the the call was to initially do a five year analysis of the crash data. Um, what we really, after looking at it, wanted to expand that. We did a ten year look at crashes, um, which really allowed us to spot any trends any um, areas with significant deficiencies. As you can see on the slides, we have been trending in the right direction over the past five years. The, the crashes are down. We hope it keeps going that way. And um, you know, we're, while we created the playbook, a lot of the plays in the playbook we're already using. So we're, we're seeing the results of those in our current analysis, um, as you can see in these slides. Some major um, results of the study were a, uh, uh, not a, the study, excuse me, the creation of the plan were solutions, um, large scale solutions in our trouble corridors, such as the ones you see above. Um, the slides you're seeing the, are, there's one for a uh, Granite Street at Whitwell that is a corridor that we have identified as having some uh, a higher crash experience that we'd like. The other is the intersection of Furnacebrook Parkway and Adam Street, which is a DCR intersection, but we did want to take a look at all city intersections, not just those owned and maintained by the city. Moving from that um, to talk about some of the projects that we currently have ongoing. I know that you have all seen them across the city, the speed feedback signs. Uh, there are 36 that have been installed on 24 streets. We have 12 more units that are going to cover six streets funded. This has been a very popular initiative and something that we've seen great success and great, um, great feedback from the residents from. RRFBs, the flashing pedestrian crossing signals that you've seen pop up all over the city. We have 27 of those installed. Five more are funded and seven more are in various st stages of planning. A project highlight. So this is Quincy Avenue. Um, this is a little bit of an older project. And the reason we wanted to include it is that we've had a lot of time to reap the results of this. This was a corridor that had a lot of crashes, a lot of serious crashes. What we did here is we road dieted it. We went from four lanes to three lanes. We added bikes, a bike lanes. We added pedestrian crossing facilities. Some results of that, uh, they've been encouraging. There's been zero serious crashes on this road since this has gone in. A more recent project is the intersection of Southern Artery and South Street. This was funded through a grant from MassDOT. What we did here is we did a uh, curb extension at the corner. What that has done is slowed the turning speeds of vehicles turning from Southern Artery to South Street. It shortened the crossing distances and we made total ADA upgrades, new APS buttons, ADA ramps. Um, this is something that we're excited to see the data from as we go over the next couple of years. What you see in front of you here, this is a um, indication of the 
pedestrian data that we're able to get from our detection cameras. We have MyVision detection cameras that help us in detecting the traffic. They provide remote monitoring so that we're able to respond to issues in the field from our office. But another benefit of that is that it provides all sorts of data and analytics. Um, you know, so I wish I had my glasses. Um, so that you see pedestrian counts, you see pedestrian delay, pedestrian compliance, all the sort of risk indicators that allow us to make decisions on changes that should be made at intersections. So we have these cameras in 44 of our 110 intersections with an additional 18 being funded through mitigation and grant funding and no city dollars spent on those. Safety improvements, some education and outreach that we've done. We've partnered with MassDOT, the Traffic Safety Division, to um, be part of a couple of campaigns that we're, we've been excited to be a party to. Um, this one is Be Seen, Be Safe. We distributed um, reflective strips and educational materials, a couple of schools, a, a few local businesses. We've also been party to safety videos that have been put out by the MB, excuse me, the MassDOT. Um, we're revamping our website. We're currently in the process of getting that a little more legible for our residents. Um, you know, we're going to add some project profiles that are, uh, you know, one sheet, easily distributable um, profiles that really tell the public what we're doing and what the benefits of these projects are. Some upcoming projects. Um, some of these are not directly oversaw, seen by our department, but we will certainly be extremely involved in it. Um, a couple that will point out key ones, C Street, the soup to nuts reconstruction of the road that's from Quincy Shore Drive to Palmer Street. Uh, there's multiple key, uh, key intersections that will go through there. Um, bike facilities, pedestrian upgrades, we're excited about that. Uh, we are Rashuti Drive at Willett Street, the off ramp that got a lot of uh, questions. And um, to give you kind of an update where we are on that project, the, uh, the project's at 25% design. We had a comment resolution meeting. Um, the next step would be to schedule with the DOT a public comment meeting. We're anticipating that will happen sometime January or February of this coming year. From that point, uh, after all the comments are brought in, the, uh, you know, the design team will get back together. It'll move towards 100% design. At that point, it'll be turned over to DOT for funding. A little bit of a backstory on Rishruti Drive since it did come up. Um, this has been in discussions from the city side since 2018 that it was brought to the state. We said, hey, we think that we have a problem here. What the state basically said is prove it. We proved it. They didn't want to touch it unless we could prove to them through analysis that there was a warrant for a signal to be there. Once that was proved, they basically, you know, started to work with us on, um, you know, a, a traffic audit, a safety audit. Uh, we have a firm, Fuss and O'Neill, working on the design that we are party to. We have basically assumed the, uh, the burden of proof in design for that intersection. We're very much looking forward to getting it to a point where we can hand it off to the DOT for funding and construction. Some projects on the horizon from the city side, we recently received a $366,000 grant for Washington Street. That is for upgrades to the transit signal priority um, and bus network um, some to make the buses more dependable, better to use, and also it gives us a good opportunity to upgrade our detection in the, that corridor on our traffic signals. Uh, Adam Street at Whitwell Street, traffic calming, visibility treatments for pedestrians. We've had um, a public meeting on that with Councilor Phelan. <clears throat> We have some uh, great feedback from that that we're incorporating to a, as we move towards a final concept and design on that. And then West Guantanamo Street is another grant, um, I believe just over 200,000 that we received for pedestrian improvements over at the intersection of West Guantanamo, Bayette and Arlington, uh, Stratton, excuse me. With that, I'll turn it over to this rule. Hi everyone. Um, so Eddie touched very greatly on a lot of the safety initiatives that we're working on uh, within our department. Um, and I just wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, traffic volumes in the city. Thank you. 
uh, traffic volumes in the city and um, what we're doing to help move traffic. Because obviously we want people to move safely, but also efficiently through the city. I know that's a big concern of residents. Um, so what we have here, and this is made available um, by our detection platform, MyoVision, where we're able to get diagnostic information uh, from the traffic signals. So this is a snapshot of uh, Washington Street at Southern Artery in May of 2019, um, back when traffic conditions were largely considered typical. Um, we've had an interesting several years of atypical traffic conditions, um, but you know this is this is what things looked like pre pre COVID. So flash forward to the same Thursday in May, three years later, May of 2022, um, we're seeing an increase in traffic, but generally traffic patterns um, have been restored to normal or greater than normal conditions or greater than 2019 conditions. Um, very noteworthy is the increase in multimodal travel. Um, in that time frame, we did add bike lanes on Washington Street. Thankfully, we're seeing a great increase in cycling activity. Um, commiserate with that improvement, we're seeing more pedestrian activity, more people walking around. Um, just the daily number of, of travel up five and a half percent, which isn't out of the realm of what we'd expect for typical growth over three years, but still, still growth nonetheless. Um, and this, this intersection really does help represent travel regionally through the city um, at Washington and Southern Artery. You have folks like myself on the wrong side of the bridge that come into the city every day and then also local travel around this area of the city. So a few projects that we've been working on uh, to help improve traffic flow around the city. Uh, Eddie touched briefly on it, the Washington Street multimodal improvements. Um, we received a grant from MassDOT through their Shared Streets and Spaces program um, for $360,000. Um, it helps in a lot of facets, but one way it really helps capacity is by improving the detection systems that are necessary um, for those intersections along that corridor. Um, Franklin Street, that corridor, um, was identified as a local bottleneck, and we were able to receive grant funding from MassDOT and their local bottleneck program to make improvements to the three traffic signals, School Street, Water Street, and Independence Avenue. Um, Hannon Bergen Parkway, we've internally done some phasing improvements. Um, you know, there's traffic queuing issues between that intersection and the parking way intersection. Longer term, we do have improvements to realign the parking way intersection, intersection with Macomba Way. Um, but in the short term, we made some improvements to try and provide some relief for people traveling through that corridor. Uh, and C Street timing and phasing improvements. Um, at C Street in Coddington, uh, I'm sure anyone, especially us folks at 55 C Street, leaving the DPW in the afternoon, a um, lot of queuing on C Street, major corridor for travel um, you know, between the South Shore and Boston. And um, we've provided some, some changes to the traffic signal, some improved coordination between that and McGrath Highway to keep the queuing from extending back into the intersection and uh, just minimizing queuing on C Street. So I can attest it's certainly been easier to get out of the, build, um, the driveway at 4.30. All right, and I'm going to turn it over to Eddie to talk about our bicycle network. Thank you. So before you is the map of the current bike facilities, uh, both constructed and planned in the city of Quincy. Uh, we are currently over 10 miles of designated bike facility. In 2020, we were designated a bike-friendly community. Since then, we have added six miles of bike facilities uh, or are, that have been added or are under immediate construction. The, most, the two that we're looking at right now are Adam Street between Whitwell and Furnaceburg Parkway and uh, Willard Street as part of the DPW's reconstruction of the road. There are five and a half miles of bicycle network at various stages of planning. And I just want to reiterate that, you know, we are looking at, you know, when roads come under construction, we use it as an opportunity to see if there's feasibility for bikes to be added. We get a, uh, a lot of guidance from the uh, Bicycle Commission, which is something that uh, our employees are uh, very happy to serve and work with that group. Um, Quinn Cycles is another group that is extremely um, well well attended and we are uh, have a close working relationship with them. Um, we look forward to adding more bike paths, both 
on and off road as uh, we move forward. <laughs> All right, you're so much taller than me. Um, just to touch briefly on some of the transit improvements that we've been working on. So just to take um, a small step back to 2018, um, this council provided us funding to do traffic um, technology upgrades at several of the intersections. And included in that was an emergency preemption system that's GPS based that we have at several locations across the city. Through conversations with the MBTA and the um, manufacturer of that equipment, we found that that GPS unit's also able to communicate with the automatic vehicle location system that's in the MBTA buses. So we've been working on transit signal priority, um, which basically the GPS unit has zones that are programmed, and as the bus passes through those zones, the signal takes in that information, sees how close the bus is coming, and then try, tries to hold the signal green until the bus passes through. Um, the key thing that uh, you know the MBTA gets in feedback is people don't want to take transit because they don't feel that it's reliable. They don't know when the bus is coming. They don't know how long their trip is going to take. Um, so this is an initiative to try and help improve that reliability. Um, and I would just note that we are um, a leader in New England for transit signal priority. The MBTA is also uh, using Quincy as a case study for um, a paper to be submitted to the Transportation Research Board. So we're very proud to be on the, uh, the front end of this technology. And with that, um, Thank you for allowing us to present, and we'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank, thank you. Before I open it up to the, my fellow counselors for comments and questions, um, Director, I just want to thank you for bringing in the traffic engineer, Allison Rule. I see Allie all over the city walking around and checking on things, and I've seen her all the community meetings. Really appreciate that, because when I first got into the city council in 2016, it was very difficult to get the traffic engineer out of the office. So. Thank you so much, Allie. It's a constitute. Thank you so for coming out. So with that, counselors, I open it up. I'm going to go. Um, Council McCarthy, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. President. Allie, Ed, uh, thanks for coming. Um, really no questions. Just a lot of thanks uh, for the countless meetings that I've come down to the office, uh, you know, and all the projects that we've dealt with. Uh, I know C Street will be coming up in the next couple of years which will be a big project. Um, there's been a lot of action in Ward 1, but um, all the small things do count. Uh, signage, uh, working with me with the MBTA stops, everything under the sun that I either came down to talk to you, Ali, about traffic or Ed, you know, and the many conversations we have on, uh, on different things. They get taken care of within, you know, 24 hours. There's somebody down there um, not only addressing the, the issue, but possibly even talking to the resident that called up. So um, I know the Ward 1 folks uh, uh, have been very impressed with some of the things we've done and, and some of the things that are tough to do. When an intersection that's busy and they want everybody to go slow and everyone to, you know, obey the stop signs, you know, we've, you know, got a little... Uh, creative at different places um, without uh, really um, putting too much signage up, and uh, I think it helps. So, uh, Ed, it's been a big plus, and Allie, uh, you know, I enjoy both uh, both you folks working with you, and I, and I know, uh, you know, when you get something, you run with it, and it you take care of it too from A to Z. Uh, so, thank you very much, and great presentation. Thank you. Thanks very much. It's a pleasure working with you. You know, we're lucky to have the staff that's been in place to be able to respond to those things as quickly and as creatively as you put it uh, sometimes. So we're very lucky. Council Yang, you have the floor. Thank you, Thank you Council. Um, I just want to quickly say and, and start with that, you know, when Chris Cassani was with his department, he did remarkable things, I think, with it. But then when the two of you, um, you know, have taken it over ever since and the team of people you work with, I mean, it's been remarkable to see the improvements across the city, um, the response rates to constituent concerns. I mean, it's just... I, I can't I can't sing your praises enough, and so I want to start by actually singing your praises. Um, I just have one question for you. So you all, are, again, are doing remarkable work, and if we could just put everything in your hands, that's kind of how I would just like to see it happen from now on. What I'm getting at is I love the goal, and I think it's ambitious, like you said, to 
strive towards uh, zero serious injuries and fatalities by 2040. Um, my only concern, and I just want to voice it here, uh, is not with you all. It's um, the fact that we have many roads in Quincy that we have uh, little control over because they're not Quincy owned, right? <laughs> I'm talking about state owned DCR roads. Um, and I'm not saying that we don't have a good partnership with the state. Of course we do. And obviously that's clear in the funding support that we've got um, to make the improvements we need to see across the city on you know various things that we've needed. I just want to make sure that logistically speaking, when it comes to your department's very ambitious goals, which I think you all accomplish, right? So keep them up. Um, is there anything, again, that we need to be mindful of that you might come across as, um, I guess, barriers to achieving your goals? And if there aren't any that you can think off the top of your head, I just want to put it out there that I do recognize that you can't fix all of the streets in Quincy that you want to because they're not owned by Quincy, right? And so um, I guess it's a question that you don't have to again answer right now, but if there are any um, issues or things that come up that you can think of that we could be helpful with um, to ensure that you do meet this kind of very ambitious goal. I, I want to know about it for sure. Sure. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, that is certainly something that, you know, we've taken into consideration when making this goal. Um, we do have a, a number of streets. So uh, many of our largest intersections are not under the control of the city. They're under the control of the state. We do have uh, great partnerships with those agencies. We did include all of those streets in our um, analysis just because we didn't think it was right to leave them off with their, their in Quincy, the Quincy residents using them. Um, so, you know, we will certainly be striving to work with them to get them on the same page as us. The state has made um, similar goals recently. Uh, so we're, we're hoping to be in lockstep with them on this side of the uh, initiative. And, um, you know, this is going to certainly take help from everybody to get there, so uh, I appreciate your, your your ability to come to us, and we'll certainly be coming to you with uh, you know any questions, any help we might need along the way. Yeah, please do. You guys are setting the standard, and when it comes to some of those, um, I'm looking at the, the the graphs here. Some of these fatal crash and serious injury crashes are on DCR-owned roads, and so again, just I appreciate that you're taking them into consideration. You're looking at the numbers. You're putting that information in front of us, and again, you're, you're setting a very high goal, but you're also setting the standard to get it done. So keep at it. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. President. Counselor, you finished? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, Counselor Andronico, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, Ed Alley, thank you so much for the presentation tonight. And I always love presentations that show a lot of data that can give us a, an idea of where we've been, where we are, and, and kind of where we're headed. Um, just comments pretty similar to, to Councillor McCarthy. Um, I think the steps that you and your department have taken um, have been noticed by at least my constituents. You know, I, I think when looking at that map, uh, a lot of Ward 2 um, and sort of the big four over there with Washington Street, Southern Artery, Franklin Street, mm -hmm. and Quincy Ave. Um, you guys have taken a lot of steps to improve the safety of those areas in particular. And I know it's always a work in progress and usually when I give at a call, he says, oh yeah, we've already thought about that and, and here's kind of where, where we're at and where we're headed. Um, so that's greatly appreciated. I always I like to know that when I pick up the phone to give you guys a call that you'll get right back to me uh, yep. about these concerns. Um, just keep doing what you're doing. Uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Hold on, Council. Council Mahoney, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. So. Um, I'm just gonna go over a few things. And um, I noticed that in your presentation, that, so one of the things that we didn't go over was, it's, it's just, you take care of so much that's going on in the city, but also the garages and Quincy and the sure. parking. So I didn't see that in the presentation. Sure, we, we kind of looked at this as more, those are ongoing um, yep. operations. We wanted to kind of focus on the, uh, the improvements, the, the project initiatives that we have going on. So I think I, the I, initial I, request though was like anything that brought in revenue, anything that was costing the city to be able to show the budgets. And I'll have to give an A to the DBW because they actually came in and said, this is what the cost of these projects were. Not that you don't, because you said at the beginning that you don't necessarily have budgets for these, but we do have Fuss and O'Neill that's being, um, who's, who's charged with some <laughs> of that work. Where is that money coming from? How are we accounting for those types of things? That was what the initiation of this kind of conversation was. It was, it's, a, it's also about all of the projects, but it's also about, you know, the finances of what you're doing and how you're getting these things accomplished. Sure. So, it, and it's, it, it's just, it's just, a, you know, I, I, the same thing happened with the, um, 
the Commissioner of Natural Resources. You know, he was mentioning it as he went, but it's just, it's easier if we can have that kind of broken out as to like where, where is that coming from? Like I know like when we were meeting with Whitwell, the rotary part of Whitwell, it was identified, I think, that there was some mitigation money that was coming from um, Fox Rock, but it was, I think it was, I don't think it was completely, maybe you can answer that. Fox, is Fox Rock paying for the Fuss O'Neill study that we're doing for the rotary or um, is that coming from the city at some other place in the city? Sure. So, uh, yes, the mitigation funds from the 114 Whitwell project mm -hmm. are, um, that is what the design of the intersection improvements at Whitwell and Adams is being paid for right now. Yeah. Correct. And I think it was identified at that meeting that we're not sure where the, you know, the development of the cost, the, the money that would cost to actually develop that, if that was to go through. It hasn't been decided that that was going to be something that we would do, but that would be something we'd have to identify. That's, that's, it's not a criticism. It's just a, it's a, just a note that sure. that was kind of the, um, the flavor of what we were asking people sure. to come before you know, us. And this, I, but this is also great. I mean, you, I know yeah. that you guys do a ton of work, so it's just, it's just that, um, to be fair, that's the, the, the initiative was that we do an awful lot of work in the city of Quincy, and then the question is oftentimes is where is some of these things being funded by? Sure. Um, like I also know um, for your, uh, I believe, I think the Southern Artery, C Street, McGrath Highway, I think that's, is that being funded by the, the police public safety headquarters? Correct. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, again, this would be for transparency for the departments, what you're working on and how it's interacting with some of the bigger projects that we're working on. But without that, we have to kind of piece it together. Or we, the city council that sit here, may know it, but the general public doesn't know where those things are coming from. Um, I know that the C Street corridor, that's something that we're working with the Mass DOT for, because that's another thing that we've been working with. So, I mean, there's certain things that we are working through. Um, and then the Rashuti Drive piece, we had extensive discussions about that earlier this evening. Um, you know, and then that's playing into a whole other piece. But if you understand, I'm just trying to get at the transparency of how yeah, totally we're understand. working as a, um, as a city as a whole. And it's very difficult as a city councilor to keep track of everything. Sure. So a general constituent at home is completely, you know, relying on us to be able to ask those questions and oftentimes we don't have the answers for them. Sure, and I, I'm sorry that I uh, it's okay. you know, misunderstood and didn't provide all that. I'm, I'm happy to get you any of that that you need and we can figure out a way to share it. Um, so one of the comments that I had was with the garage, I think it was in the paper that um, the garages are not at full capacity and, and that's something I'm just interested in learning a little bit more about as to where we stand now. I think some of it may have had to do with COVID, maybe that's changed since then. Um, it was just recently reported in that particular case and also over, I think, over by the um, Ross parking lot, that parking lot that we have over there. Just the revenues that we're bringing in, I think it's enough to be able to offset what we're doing, but at the same time, it's just something that we want to try to keep track of. Um, then in regards to, um, the other thing was the permitting, parking permitting that are happening throughout the city. I know there's certain areas that you've been doing that in, and I know we've talked before, Ed, where it's like certain sections of the city have to deploy people out. How many people do you have? doing the ticketing for you at this current time. I know the police do it during the after hours um, for things, but you know we have a lot of um, ground to cover, and how is that? how are you handling that? Sure, okay, so the garage, your question is about the, the revenues that are coming into the garage? Yeah, and also the capacity of the garages. Are they full? What are we seeing that's happening at those garages? Sure, so what I'll tell you is the, the garage on a day-to-day -day ba basis has availability for parking. There, we have a robust business parking program uh, that has over 500 customers. Um, we also have residential parking in the garage. So on like a, a per numbers garage, if everybody were to show up on the same day, we are, um, you know, a lot fuller than it would appear to be if you drive through there. That's you, a, a good I guess place if you to could, be. You don't have to do it tonight. I'm not asking you to know this off the top of your okay. head, but I know the residential parking in the garages, those are deals that we made with certain Correct. buildings. If you could just maybe, I, just to refresh us, because I think there is the, um, the O'Connell building that definitely uses some of the um, Kilroy parking lot um, garage, but I think also the um, LBC also has a piece of that too. So if you could just let us know what the percentage of that is that's going out to residential parking. The percentage, I can tell you that LBC mm -hmm. has 150 spots leased to them. Mm -hmm. They're currently using short of 100. And I could, uh, Mr. O'Connell's building, they have, I believe it's 156 spaces. That is nested parking that's in the basement. Okay. And how many total spaces do we have in that garage? 712. 
So that leaves us 400. And then we have, you said that you have um, business people that are leasing spaces to. How many of those are being leased by 500, did you say? Approximately. So, so I leaves, can get you that final number. If. That, so that leaves us around 200 for um, just general people to be able to use, correct? Just anybody that's going to the square to, to be able to use. 200 spaces, approximately. Uh, it would be lower than that because the the business parking is the okay. 150 yep. spaces are nested. Okay. Approximately. Okay. Yep. And then as it goes to uh, parking permits, mm -hmm. the permit zones, we have five zones, North Quincy, Wollaston, Quincy Center, mm -hmm. Penn's Hill, and South Quincy. Quincy Adams, thank you. So one of the things, and we had talked about this before too, though over in North Quincy, I think some of the development that's happened over in North Quincy was uh, um, designated transit-oriented development. Sure. And some of those condominiums that were approved in planning um, were told that that was a designated trans, uh, transit. But when they sold them, the people who bought them were told, oh, yeah, you can park on the street, but you can get a permit. But they couldn't. And remember, I had this conversation. Yep. So, mm -hmm. And you were going to give me back all of the buildings that, of, um, that were in designated um, transit-oriented areas that they didn't have parking because that became kind of a relative conversation for that. So I never received that. Sure. I mean, we have the list of all the addresses that aren't eligible for the program on our website and on like four different spaces. I'm happy to get you that list. Yeah. I think you added that to it after we had that conversation. The reason why I'm bringing that up, though, is because, you know, when you're when these buildings are being sold, they're not being sold with that kind of caveat because it's not part of the it's not part of the condominium um, agreement when it was done. And that was some confusion for the people who were purchasing it. It's, it's definitely in the court of, of the fact that they purchased it. It's Quincy's rules, but we have to be clear about those things. One of the things that I did like in your presentation, I liked a lot of things in your presentation, but one of the things that I wanted to call out or just ask a question in regards to was the, um, was the um, transit improvements, which was the, um, for the buses. Yep. And where, I know that, that there was money that was provided a couple of years ago. Where, where are those, those crossovers that are where are they located in the city where are those units yeah uh in quincy center you you would probably be there throughout the center um we've added the extension coming down washington street is where the grant that we just recently received is targeting mm -hmm. wrapping around to um south street howard street that direction are there plans to have more of those types of things for to be able to work with the MBTA on that? Because I do know one of the questions that we've is constantly being had is that, you know, we want to be more of a, a walkable city, yeah. um, a, you know, and, and also a commuter city. Yeah. And um, I know that in the past, other councillors have asked also to increase bus routes, but to be able to do that, they had the MBTA has to have people using those buses. And sure. by having something like this, this is actually a positive thing for the city because it's a great thing. Yeah. Because it, it, it's giving them the timing and approximate time of when the bus is coming. I know when I travel to other, other um, cities or other parts of the, that other parts of the country that you, you know, you, their transit orientation is, is really well, like it's a, a well machine. Yeah. And that's not to say that we're not doing it. It's that it's also the MBTA that needs to work with us as well. Does the MBTA, um, help offset any of that any of that cost that we're, the city's taken on, or is it something you're just working with them on? So it's something we're working with them on. We've been um, uh, our initial investment in the technology was actually for an emergency preemption system um, for our police and fire to use. Right. And it was sort of after the fact that we realized that this same technology could be harnessed to uh, coordinate with the MBTA buses and create this transit signal priority protocol that's been in, put in place. Mm -hmm. So since that original investment, the, the expansion of the network has really come via grant money. Um, so that is how we are getting these things in our cabinets. Um, and, you know, we are certainly kind of early in this. As Ali said, we're, we're a region, if not a country leader on this. We're working with the T on a case study to kind of prove that the way that we're doing it is the, what should be the standard nationwide. Yep. So I'm thinking it's something that we will certainly be looking to grow yeah. um, through a partnership with the T. But it's something that I think is uh, well worth city funds to do because it makes the buses run better, which gets people on the bus, which gets them out of their cars. I think there's other places in the country that do much better than we do, but it's nice to think that we'll be the standard. I'm saying we're standard. a leader on the yeah. priority. Mean, yeah, there is. 
I, I just know that I've used public transportation in other other areas that it's just, in, I mean, that's not a, that's an MBTA thing too. That's like, oh, yeah, you know, totally, it's, it's yeah. A, you know, so there's, that's a universal problem. So if you could solve the problems for the MBTA, then we're doing great. Let's help um, along a little on bit. On the Quincy Ave site too, there's just a question, and I've called about this too. Um, you know, when it comes to parking in the city of Quincy, we do have some challenges throughout all of our neighborhoods and all of our communities. And, you know, when we're in a, in a road that has a double yellow line, let's say going down a, a street with a double yellow line, there's not supposed to be, you're not supposed to be parking on the street on those streets, are you? No, you'd be in a lane of travel. I mean, you'd be in a lane of travel. You'd be in a lane of travel. So, and I've called about this, like, you know, I can say on um, Robinson Stedman Street. Street. Yeah, Stedman Street. Stedman Street, yep. constantly parking on the yep. street. Um, and there, it happens all over the city. And I, and I don't know whether or not they're doing it to try to maybe calm traffic themselves because I know sometimes people will take it into their own hands by putting their own cars out in the streets to try to calm traffic because people are going too fast down the street but it's also not supposed to be what people are doing so how do we handle those types of things so specifically on Stedman Street there was a, a whole block that never had a double yellow on it and that's where people were parking mm -hmm. we established a double yellow on that block to do a couple things to a to narrow the lanes to make speeding less uh, feasible to make people feel a little bit more boxed in when they're in a that car mm -hmm. B to establish a uh, baseline that there shouldn't be cars parked in a travel lane on a road like Stedman Street that handles the number of cars that it handles a day. Mm -hmm. And that and that happens again. This is it's it's Stedman Street, but I've noticed it. And actually, it's funny because in one of your presentations, you actually have somebody parked on um, the double lanes. A double yellow. It's kind of off to the the bike path is going down. This car kind of kitty cornered on the. On your picture. It's just, probably our car when we were taking it might the be. picture. Yeah, <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, I'm not looking for you to take yeah. anybody. I'm just saying this is kind of funny because it's like it's it's yeah. a nuisance throughout the whole thing. One other question, and you know, I I I I, I do think like the, the being able to identify who's working on what. Like I think is Vasco Neil the is that the prominent engineer that's working that or group that's working on all of your projects in your in your department, or are there other ones? Uh, Fuss and O'Neill is currently working on uh, the Rashuda Drive project and then also the roundabout at Adams Whitwell. Okay. We work with McMahon. Um, we work with, those are probably the two, the main ones that we use. Okay. So, so if, and then the ones that put the at Mass DOT, they're doing, the, where, are we have, are we reviewing, or who's reviewing Mass DOT, when Mass DOT is presenting, who's, who's reviewing what Mass DOT is suggesting to do? Uh, are you talking about Rashuti? No, I'm talking about um, C Street. The C Street corridor, like when uh, they're it's beta group. The beta group, okay. Is that us? That's the, is that our our group, or is that the um, Matt, the state group that's doing it? They were hired. They were hired by the city since it's a city roadway, so the city funds the design and ha and chooses the designer, and then okay. it's on the state tip for construction. Okay, and then um, and who's doing the Southern Artery C Street McGrath Highway? Who's who's working on that one? Southern Artery, C Street to McGrath, Access Management and Medium Division, Public Safety Headquarters. Those would have been current. Those would have been current, okay. Okay. Um, so the last, the last, the last question that I have, and this is just a, this is this is again where the interconnectivity happens within the departments. We talk about interconnectivity, but I'm not sure if it's really happening. Um, and that's not a knock to anybody because I think everybody has a lot of work on their plates. But but when we're seeing, and I've seen this through zoning and planning, when people are presenting, every time you have a development that's being presented in the city of Quincy, it's presented with the intentions that there's a traffic. Sometimes there's a traffic engineer that's presenting. Sometimes there's not. But there's going to be zero, no impact to our streets in the city of Quincy. And we're adding a ton of um, cars potentially to that area and it's it seems to me that when we said like when you had your piece in here where it's like in 2019 prior, prior to COVID, COVID and in 2022 we see an increase and oftentimes what we hear is that's cut through traffic that's happening in Quincy but we have a lot a lot of development that's happening so how do you manage the development that's happening in Quincy and the roads and the traffic that we're dealing with I know that you're moving it because you're trying to make the lights work faster but it's a constant challenge so I'm trying to I'm asking because I, I really feel as though your department has a plays a critical part in in reviewing those things, and when it comes back with zero to no impact, especially on C Street, because there was a big F um, from the actual track and uh, traffic engineer for one of the um, for one of the plans that was before um, zoning, and it, there was no impact, there was no feedback from our side. So I was just curious to know how does that get how does that get handled? 
And it was because it was at five o'clock at night and you were describing C Street to us about how hard it is for you to get out at the end of the day, but you've changed the, the, um, the lights and how they work. Sure, so I, I think that's a multi-part question. I, what we do is we are certainly part of the planning review process when mm -hmm. we, get, we get these plans uh, sent to us. It's part of our purview to, to comment on that, to sniff out anything that we don't agree with, to advocate for the city and for its residents to mitigate any sort of um, you know, disturbances that we think may come from new buildings, new whatever is going in anywhere. Um, I think Allie could probably speak to this a little bit better as far as um, the result of the traffic study. I think when they say the little to no impact, it's in the, you know, the scope of the plan, you know, and it's in the scope of there being already at that intersection, tens of thousands of cars a day. So when we're adding, you know, less than a percent of cars, that would be a hit the, uh, but the problem is, is everything's being looked at one off. So if you're looking at something one off and this is here and then two doors down, we have another one that's going to be 40 and another one, two doors down or in a neighborhood where you're coming out of a neighborhood and it's a development that's going to have six here and 12 here and 13 here and 24 here. Each one is being looked at individually as, a, as opposed to, and it's not, it's sometimes right. it's because they're coming in separately, yeah. but, but sometimes they're not, there's a bigger plan because the same people are coming back potentially a year later saying, now we're going to develop 24 across the street. So how do you manage that? We manage it that we are the ones that are looking at it as a whole, kind of knowing what's going where and using our strategies that we've established both, you know, before and during this process with the safety to make sure that, you know, any additional growth that comes that we are ready to handle it. We are ready to make sure that any pedestrians that are coming to this project are adequately taken care of any, that there's bikes, that there's bus facilities, yeah. that there's, you know, that we have room for growth. It's important. Did you want to add anything to that? I think you look like you, I, know, I don't know. You look like you were. You look like you were trying to add something to it. So I'm not sure. Sure. So um, I I review. I'm having difficulty with this microphone tonight. I apologize. Um, I review the traffic studies and, and developments um, that come in through planning and coordinate with the planning department mm -hmm. um, on my findings of it. Um, I guess the key things that I look for when I'm reviewing it, firstly, is everything that they've done correct to the appropriate engineering standards. Is the trip generation consistent with IETE standards? Is there... So when you, you know, see somebody that's coming in and they have a... They may not have in the plan an F rating, but then the, the, the traffic engineer then says there's an F rating to it. Is there any time that you kind of... In a presentation, do you, do you kind of go back and go, wait, they didn't have an F rating there, but they're saying it's an F rating at 5 o'clock. I mean, I just... I'm asking this question because... I think sometimes what's presented is one thing, but then if you actually go down and you're the traffic, you, know, you guys work in traffic, so you'll know. But I mean, very often we're we're creating. You often hear, "Oh, it's not. This is this is a cut through city. It's not. It has nothing to do with all the development that's happening." But we're creating some of the problems that we have here. And I'm just I, I'm not anti development, but I am questioning. You know, when's the check and balance happen when it's happening within a corridor or within a certain section? Because we can only handle so much you know, so much more. And then we're going to, we're creating that, we're creating our own problems. We're creating our own, our own issues. So I'm a little confused when you say like, uh, it's one off and we're still looking at things one off when we should be looking at things a little bit more holistically on streets because the lights can only handle what they can handle. I, I, I just, I, I need some form of an explanation for that if you can. Sure. So I'm, they're following engineering standards for what they're including in their studies. And sometimes it is a little bit one-off, right? They have a capture area that, you know, I think it's within 5% of traffic increase anticipated for an intersection that they would include that as part of their study area. And for larger developments, we'll have some kind of scoping meeting where we, you know, discuss with the developer what we'd like to see included and analyzed and what our expectations are to certainly set the expectations early. Um, could you in tell their me future one projections, okay. they would be required to include any development um, in the surrounding area to mm -hmm. be included in their analysis. So as it relates to, you know, C Street, for example, if there's another development occurring down the street mm -hmm. um, that comes in after another development, they would need to include that development in their analysis for their future projections. So then they baseline that future projection and then look at the difference between build without with and without their specific project. And that hap that ha that helps Sally because I think I think that's what I was getting at is like it's a little it's a little one-sided when everybody says there's no impact to traffic when everybody can look at it 
and say there's definitely an impact to traffic. I mean, there are people who live in our city who can basically say, I used to be able to cross the street and not take my own life in my hands, but now when I try to cross the street at a light that's red that says that I, that I have the crosswalk, that I'm still afraid to cross the street. Or I know we have bike paths throughout the city, which I went out for a ride on Saturday with Quinn, with, with Quinn Cycles, and I was like, you know, riding to meet you was scary. Riding with you was not. <laughs> but like riding as a singular rider in the city of Quincy, it can be a little intimidating because because cars just kind of ride up the back of your heels and you're riding in the path that we're supposed to be riding in, or the path ends and then it's like, well, where do I go now? Or, you know, like somebody had brought up to me, you know, the General's Bridge has the, um, has the bike paths and it tells you to take a right onto Bergen Parkway. Bergen Parkway is a highway, so you really can't take a right onto Bergen Parkway. So safety-wise, you have to ride on the sidewalk even though you're not supposed to ride on sidewalks if you're a bicycle rider. But you would never ride anywhere else because you die on Bergen Parkway if you rode your bike. So those are the types of things that when you're seeing these things, and I know that you're working towards those things, but needs to be clearer of what we're, what we're accomplishing. And then also when development's coming through, I've yet to ever hear that our TPAL has pushed back on any of the development as far as traffic engineering that's coming through. Yet when the question comes up or people talk about traffic in our city, what we hear back all the time is it's cut through traffic and it's been going on since the forever. But we're creating it too, so we have to own we have to own some of that as well. So I'm just I'm I, and that's I, I'm not going to drive this nail into the coffin any further. I'm just trying to say that that's something that we need to be a little bit better about how we're doing this. I think you do a fantastic job, but I also think you have a very challenging job as well because you know you're inherently taking care of the things that are being you know created and handed to you because the traffic is going to come from those things but you have a say in it too but can you think of any projects that have come before us where you've pushed back and said no it's a bad development because of what's going to happen to our streets um sure i mean I'm sure you have <laughs> <laughs> so i've um we're going to finish up this question and then we're going to move on with other people go, go right ahead Okay. Thank you. So often what I look for are ways to offset the impacts of the project and push for mitigation. So an example like the queue up on Rashudi Drive. I know we talked a lot about Rashudi Drive, um, or you all did before we presented today. But you know the mitigation from that development, for example, and, and the magnitude of a quarter million dollars is funding the design for the traffic signal at the bottom of that hill. So we got something really positive out of that development and the mitigation for it. Um, one specific project that we've pushed back on was something that was going in on Broad Street that uh, me and Mr. Timmons ended up in in court over um, due to the traffic impact. So and that's great, and that's the that's that's the only reason why I really brought it up. If I could, if you could indulge me, just one last question, just one last question. So just one last question. So the one last question that I have was just we're going to hold academy. you off. Hold on, All we're right. going to hold her off. You actually went five minutes over. Okay. Are the other colleagues still want to discuss, and we'll go back to you for five minutes. So hold that question, that one question. Okay, thank you. Council Harris, you, you are then me. So, so let I, I, I yield to. So, so the trend of thought is the conversation. Okay. Minutes to yep. uh, wrap up her her de deliberation. It's, it's not. It's not going to take five minutes. So, I thank you very much. And that was not meant to be a knock. It's just meant to be like it is. A, it is a huge concern. People do not think that there's any pushback in the city of Quincy when it comes to things. And I know that there has to be. I can't imagine in the wild, my wildest dreams that there's things that come before you that you don't. Maybe there are things that you want to push back even further on, but you can't because, um, for whatever reasons, you can't. How does the um, parking? This is a this is a critical question. So the city of Quincy's taken over the two buildings next to the Adams Academy, and it was purchased with CPA monies. Who's parking at that those two lots? First of all, CPA monies should never be used for a parking lot. That's that's just a fact. Um, but there's parking that's happening over there. So who's parking at the those two that that parking lot that was created? So the Historic Society has always had a relationship where they have people that are parking at the Adams Academy lot. Um, I'm not talking about the Adams Academy lot. I'm talking about the extended parking lot that's gone into the two. It was a uh, I think that was in It was a uh, um, it was a funeral home and something else that was over there. I can't remember what was else was over there. But those two buildings got taken down, and they were um, they were raised. And there's a parking lot that's been extended. You go through the Adams Academy, but now there's more. Parking. So is it the Adams Academy that's parking there? Um, Council Mahoney, we, we also are going to have the uh, mayor's representative, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Walker. Okay. Well, I, I just Mr. thought Walker, you because it was parking. Floor. That's fine. As well. <laughs> Through you, Mr. Uh, Mr. President, those spaces are being rented by the bank that was displaced by the construction on Hancock Street. Uh, and potentially 
some construction vehicles uh, as well from those two construction projects. Um, but those, those are being rented. Um, it's not free. No. So I guess, is it being rented through TPAL? Like, I guess I'm confused by that because I thought all parking went through TPAL. Is it being taken care of through TPAL or who's it being taken care of through? We, on the, some of the property that we have in the downtown, it falls within the district. It is handled um, through Granite, Pot, Granite City Partners. Some of it's handled through TPAL. In this particular case, I believe it's handled through Granite City Partners. So as you can see, this is where what I was asking for budgets and where, you're, where things are coming from because one would think that any parking that's happening in the city of Quincy would be going through TPAL. And in this particular case, it's going through Granite City Partners Money's being collected, and we're not sure where that's coming from. And that goes back to the transparency issue, but that doesn't have anything to do with TPL. So I appreciate that very much. I appreciate that, Mr. Walker. Thank you very much for the presentation. And I also no thank you very much for your every time I call, your speed in which you get back in touch with me, and, um, and the fact that you're, um, whether sometimes we don't resolve things right away at the first call, but we do resolve things um, over the course of time. So I do appreciate all of the work that you do do. So thank thank you. you for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Harris, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, Thank you, and, and Ed, Ed and Ali, thank you for your presentation. Um, a, a few few questions. Um, first is uh, what was meant, uh, which br was brought to my attention by uh, Council Mahoney. The project at uh, in North Quincy by the high school, the t the um, uh, the buildings there at the T station. Yep. Right. So. Um, you did a great job with the traffic prior. I'm not saying you, you're not doing a great job with the traffic. There's an issue there that um, was brought to my attention. I actually saw it too. Um, I don't think the traffic study took in account for the target, the people that are going into the target, and the lines from McDonald's during, especially the lunchtime and dinner time, and it's causing backups that are uh, not only inconvenient, but are, um, can be deemed a safety situation where cars are going on the wrong side of the road to get around it, get around because they're impatient to get home, uh, rightfully so. Can that be, can we do, can we have a study take place on that? Certainly. Yeah, we're happy to look at that. Yeah, we'll you, we'll you, do it internally. Um, yeah. we'll, we'll take counts. We'll look at the yeah. signal timings for both that intersection and the intersection surrounding it. That's certainly something that we have the capability of doing. Oh, that's that's great. And um, and this is also a compliment to the DPW for this is on another issue. The streets, um, the streets uh, obviously with the new, the beautiful new sidewalks we've gotten in Squanum and different areas, different streets across North Quincy. Uh, but in particular, though, around Squanum School, those streets, um, folks have asked me to, to reach out to you folks up to look at one ways. Because especially with one street in particular, Park, which was a dirt road at, at one time, we have more folks traveling in different ways, plus the streets are, are narrower. They're narrowed to begin with, but with the kids and being able to walk, especially uh, the streets around that surround it, like Mayflowers on one side. And yeah. you know, if we could take a look at that and see if we can maybe, because I, I, obviously I don't want to disrupt the neighborhood by, sure. yeah, you know, you know absolutely. Um, but obviously I, I, I'd really like to see us look at that because, again, especially we're going to have, hopefully we'll, we'll be hearing about the, the new Squanum School, school. Yep. and if we can get ahead of that, maybe. Uh, but uh, they just put those beautiful new um, the new sidewalks in uh, alongside it. And, yeah, and it's it kind of you know the story. Yeah, you know, yeah. You got it. Okay. Yeah, I, I am. Uh, we hear it a lot. The the DPW does uh, all, admittedly a wonderful job on the roads, and yep. people become accustomed over the years of yep. parking up on the sidewalks. Yep. Um, so this is certainly not a unique request, and it's definitely something that, right. if you'd like, we could sort of lay out some options for you. Um, sure. I, I would anticipate anything would be right. a, a bigger neighborhood conversation. So oh, absolutely, and yeah. that's something that, of course, I'd bring to yeah. the neighborhood. The so neighbors. we'll we'll start, yep. and then um, we'll have a discussion about like the scope and all that. Happy to look be, at that. That would be great. Great. And one yeah. last thing um, is uh, again. Um, 
uh, Council Mahoney um, kind of uh, jot something. That, um, the cut through streets that I mentioned, in, 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 that was mentioned in, especially in uh, what six, we all have cut through streets, there's no doubt. Um, but especially that go down to the beach or go up from or down from the beach. Um, uh, like, for instance, uh, I, I know that uh, oh, <laughs> Mr. Walker walks out of the room because we were talking about it briefly before, uh, before you, when you were speaking. Um, but uh, here he comes back. So um, when I, I asked for help, and you've been great, we put signs, we've done yep. everything we can, except yep. for I asked about uh, speed bumps. And way back when, before your time, yep. both, both of these times, um, I was told that speed bumps were illegal and they, they don't exist. But in my new, uh, for the last year, I've been driving around Boston because I have a new job and I'm not no longer here in Quincy Center um, working. I'm driving around the city of Boston and all these little streets that are, that are really tight, uh, there's speed bumps and they're cut through streets and they're brand new speed bumps. So uh, was that a Marty Walsh thing? He was able to do whatever he wanted or, or, or <laughs> uh, and dis disregard of the law or, uh, or, you know, or are they illegal? So uh, it's a little wishy-washy. I think there's, there's a speed bump versus a speed hump. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's varying opinions over the effectiveness and if mm -hmm. there's something that even should be on the road. Mm -hmm. What I would tell you is from our standpoint, we don't think that it's a, a great solution. Mm -hmm. um, generally speaking, from what we've read and what we understand, that the speed bumps kind of create just as many issues mm -hmm. as they solve. Mm -hmm. They're loud, they damage cars, they're extremely uh, difficult to deal with in times of snow and ice. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes, all it is is a temporary slowdown and then a get on the gas and go to make up your, your lost time. It's nothing that we would recommend. We don't find it as a good solution. We think that we have enough tools in the toolkit to address the issues without trying to do that. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's where we stand and stood at sure. this point. Um, I'd ask for the opportunity on whatever road you're looking for to kind of yeah. play around with paint and signage and yeah. speed so you, you've feedback done, signs. You've done a lot for me. Yeah. The Bayfield Street, that is one of the major yep. cut throughs. Yep. Right? So, and um, you know, since since it was almost since day one since I've been in office that yep. folks have we've been talking about Bayfield. I was hoping after I saw that they were in Boston we could think about it, revisit it maybe, and take a peek at it. We uh, could we could maybe like revisit the idea of it, but it, it's not something that we think is a good option. And okay. the data on Bayfield is actually encouraging with what we've already done. Um, we actually have a concept that I'm happy to share with you about Bayfield, um, particularly North Bayfield, getting cars a little bit tighter coming off the beach to slow them down so that you don't kind of like whip around that corner um, that you're obviously sure. familiar with. Yes. Those are the sort of things that we think are effective and, uh, you know, frankly, uh, quick and cheap to do also. Okay. So that, that's the, the solutions that we really kind of rely on. Again, thank you for, for tonight. And any and on those other two issues, it'd be great to. Yeah, no problem at all. You know, Happy to start working on those. As always, you've done a fantastic job. Yeah. Thank you. Great to work with. Thank you. Okay. So, Director, we, um, you know, traffic is the number one complaint that I get throughout the city. It, it really is. And with us establishing that TPAL division, mm -hmm. your, your, you know, um, traffic parking alarm and lighting, it's come a long way from the inception of, you know, uh, Mike Coffey and then Chris Cassani, your predecessor, mm -hmm. did a real good job with getting out in the city and getting things done. And now you've done a great job in your role. Mm -hmm. um, it is something that's tough because we do, it is a cut through city. Um, and there's a lot of folks in the city just cutting through here. Um, you know, as, as the counsel for Brian Palmucci has left office, I mean, and gone to be a judge, I've taken over the role as, of, of a board four, and obviously I've given you more phone calls in the yep. last uh, couple of weeks, and we, we have a vote later on. About good something. to hear from you. You know, it's been, it's been a totally different role as an at-large counselor, and, and, and it's funny because when you're an at-large counselor, you never really want to get involved in ward counselor's issues, so I can really tee off on ward four right now and not have to worry about one of the ward counselors stepping aside and saying, yep. 
you know, what are you talking about my wood for? So um, it's really, <laughs> it's been a whole different experience as it is. But um, obviously I've talked to you about Hall Place. Yes. Which is kind of that cut through. I know there's some construction on the other ends. If we can get some data and some new yeah. studies on that. Mm -hmm. um, Upton Road has just popped up on here. Yeah. Um, obviously getting into Governor's Road, I know Quincy residents, Milton residents. Is there anything going on at Upton Road that you can talk about on Ward 4? Yeah, I'm actually happy to report we're in the middle of a, a pretty comprehensive study up there. Okay. Um, we're doing soup to nuts, turn movements, speed collection. Um, we actually, we did AM counts, I, I think it was last Wednesday. Uh, we have the PM counts, we're actually going to wait until after Thanksgiving because the yep. data gets skewed pretty much in t from now until then. Um, so it's, it's something that we're actively assessing. It is something that we hear from the residents yep. also over there. Um, we've, you know, we've installed some speed feedbacks already on Upton, on Plymouth. There's speed feedbacks that are slated for Bryant off-ramp and then also for Governor's Road. Um, there's a flashing stop that was just installed earlier this week over at the corner of uh, Bryant and Upton. So it's certainly an area that we are aware of yep. its challenges and you know, we've got some solutions in place already and we're doing counts, collecting data to kind of see, to create a document, short, long, medium term solutions in the area. I really do appreciate it. The residents have reached out to me in the last few weeks. It's, I, know it's, I know it's a cut through getting into Milton. I know in the morning if there's, unfortunately when people get on uh, Google, the Google Maps, yeah. and there's a traffic jam going on, they'll, they'll say, get me to this destination, and they'll go through these little side streets, and it, Governor's Road is one of those ones that pop up, and they, 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 they mitigate through there in the morning. Yep. You know, they do. Unfortunately, and uh, if you can collect that data and help out some of those residents with the extra yep. stuff going on there. Yep. MBTA, we talked a little bit about them changing their bus stops. Mm -hmm. I got a little bit Lincoln Heights, where the apartment buildings are yep. on Common. Is that Common Street? Center Street. They, yep. Did they move that bus stop? And if they did, can we somehow talk? Because now you're pushing the bus stop out for the residents that live up in um, the Lincoln Heights. Has that been pushed out? And we talked about bus stops in your um, MBTA bus stops in your presentation. Do you mind if we check back on that specific stop? That would be great. Get back to you. That would be great. I don't want important. to give you the wrong okay. answer. Yeah. And then um, on my list here. Um, the Independence Ave gate. Now yes. I know Chris Cassani first came in here. We were in this council. We, we vetted that thing up in, in, in Penn's Hill. Um, as I've driven by in the last year or two, I've seen not as bad as flow. How, how's everything going on over there? Uh, we are comfortable with how things go on over there. Um, you know, we think that the procedures that we put in place, the intersection improvements that we made, made a, a difference getting out ahead of that gate opening. Uh, we're still ticketing over there. The tickets are more severe yep. in that area than they okay. are anywhere else in the city. Um, so it is something that we we have, we have done, and it, it is a, a strict penalty. So we feel as though it's not something that we get a lot of repeat offenders. Yep. There's always going to be people that try their luck with it and go over there. The, the neighbors over there are extremely diligent in what's going on in the street. They're letting us know, uh, saying, like, listen, I think there's somebody coming over parking from the T. Sometimes we find out we go over there and it is a neighbor, it is someone that has a permit and it's a false call, um, which is fine because we'd rather be safe than let that neighborhood um, go how they thought that neighborhood was going to go in that. As long so, as you keep up with that mitigation of the parking violations. Yeah, absolutely. For the residents in that particular area, because it was about 75% of the people wanted that gate open. I thought it, it did a great job. Yeah, and, it's a it's and, a great uh, predecessor, Chris point. Cassani. Yeah. He was up here with us, and he did a fantastic job with yep. mitigating, and, and the, we, we jumped the fines up a little bit, and yep. we did the tow after three. Is there any towing going on over there? Uh, that we don't tow, the, the police tow, <laughs> but the uh, okay. usually we don't get to the third, Sure, you know, because it, it it's pretty hefty fine by the time you get up there. But thank you, just keep up with that because yeah. it's very important. And, Absolutely. Um, well, um, Council Phelan's not here, but I did attend your Adams Street um, roundabout where yep. Whitwell and, and, and Adams yep. kind of meet. Yep. And we had a great discussion, a lot of folks in the, in, in, in the uh, neighborhood meeting. I know yeah. you're going to be having more as we move on. Um, yeah. I think, I think you did a great job with, with, with handling the whole group. Thank you. Good, good hundred people in there that Yeah, it was, it was well attended, uh, <laughs> it was for well sure. Attended. But the, um, um, yeah, we uh, we're in th with that project now. We took we got a lot of good feedback. We got a lot of good buy-in from the neighbors on um, you know the concept. There were a lot of uh, 
issues that were brought to our attention that we've circled back with the design team to try and incorporate as many as we can to make that as a complete a solution as possible over there. So um, we're still like, we're working out the, the design comments. We're excited of the direction that that could be heading and um, looking forward to have more to share. I've, I've fielded a lot of emails and a lot of calls in that particular area over the years. And obviously we talked offline yep. about when the development up on the hospital Hill and we've gotten to the point. So we really need to help out those residents because they've been really waiting patiently. Yeah, but, um, totally agree. As the conversation moved on, a lot of people saying, you know, I think this is the best solution. This and in uh, the roundabout, you know, it's, it's, it's you, you've said you've put studies that has been done in other areas of the yeah. state. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's been very successful. Um, it's a, a solution that a lot of cities, towns, DOTs are moving towards um, to sort of cut out the new like standard like traffic signal with like three mast arms and like big ugly equipment and lights and electricity and maintenance and there's a lot of benefits to the roundabout um, from a traffic calming standpoint, from a pedestrian access standpoint, just from a, an aesthetic standpoint that we're uh, really hoping to move I mean, forward. Some of the biggest issues is coming down Whitwell. You're, you're, you're you're increasing in speed. Yep. And then as you take that right hand turn, you're going down Adams and you're extending in speed. So right. you're, you're picking up some speed. And that, that was the major, um, you know, complaints that I was getting from yeah. those residents in that particular area. Yeah, we've heard that it, yep. in the, the roundabout uh, concept would slow that approach speed, which is great. Um, you know, something that we heard a lot about was the, the crossing of across Adams Street, um, the speeds on Adam Street being a deterrent for being able to cross. And, uh, you know, the design speed of the roundabout is right around 25 miles per hour. Uh, we'll add some visibility improvements to that, the RRB, RRFB flashing beacons, uh, should we move forward with it to increase that pedestrian, you know, access as much as possible. And uh, we think it's a, a wonderful solution to be moving towards. And the last thing was lighting. And people talked about, you know, obviously getting the proper lighting in that particular area yep. as well. And you're, you're part of that division. Too, Absolutely. So. Yep. <laughs> so. But um, we, we've come a long way since this, this established some six, seven years ago. We really have in the city. Um, we, we established it. The mayor's um, administration came in and, and brought it in front of the city council. I was on the council with some of my colleagues. And we, we had to do something about what was going on out there in the city. Traffic was the number one thing. It was traffic, roads, taxes, public safety, which includes the trees, police, fire, mm -hmm. and, and staffing. Mm -hmm. Roads. Commissioner Graciaso has done an unbelievable job with the hundred million dollar, you know, hundred million dollar package that we've had, and um, doing the doing it throughout the city and being aggressive with the sidewalks, the trees and, and natural resources. We've done a lot, we've come a long way, and, and traffic. You know, uh, my last question: blinking crosswalks. Yep. How many do we have in the city, and did you get a grant for that, and do we foresee to get more of them? The RRFB crossings, those the yellow flashing lights? Yes, yes. Those are beautiful. We have. I can tell you how many we have because I wrote it down somewhere. We've installed 27 systems. Uh, many of those have been grant funded. We just received a grant from the DOT for another $50,000 worth of them, which will fund five just the equipment will have to cover equip, uh, installation costs. Okay. And then, you know, this is a solution that, this is one of those things that when we are working with developers that are coming in and how do we mitigate some of these issues, these are one of the items that, that we're pushing for is, you know, increased visibility treatments for pedestrians and the RRFB is a wonderful, especially the solar ones, um, just a wonderful solution. So there will certainly be more coming. Um, we right. have more planned, we have more coming in. This is one of those items that we're just kind of churning away um, as we get grants, as even like departmental uh, operations funds, it's a worthy investment to, to do them, so. When it first came over here from the school committee, that was my biggest item I'd talk about. We gotta get it in front of the schools, the crosswalks and the lighting and, and, and you know, more and more of the crosswalks, you yeah. know, and then the other biggest issue was around the senior housings. Yep. And I think you guys have done a great job. I'm looking forward to the more. So with 27, we got five more coming? We have, yeah, we have 27 that are installed, 27 systems. Systems. Um, we have five more that we just got the NTP for the grant to order. Okay. Um, and then there are seven more that are either um, coming as part of a planned mitigation package for developments or that we have already uh, in stock in our yard, ready to go up. It's great. I see it over at Veterans Stadium, Veterans Memorial yeah. Stadium, as well as, well as Adams, uh, yep. Adams Field right there. So 
those are high impact areas that pick up speed. So I, I want to thank you for coming in here. Allison, Rule, the Alley, thank you so much for coming in and, and giving a presentation to the council. I'm sure maybe next year we have you back again, see yeah, if the absolutely. progress is done. I, I really do appreciate you. When we had this, I had this as a resolution back in May, and then Council Mahoney also wanted it. So we're glad to have you in here. Um, and with that, councilors, we are going to um, allow them to come in the back again. And with that, thank you so much for coming in tonight. Thank you very much, President and Councilors. Thank you, Director. Madam Clerk, next item on the agenda. Number two, 2022-135 in order of land waiver of the rights for the real estate at Wentworth Road. Um, yep. motion, um, into ordinance. motion made by Council McCarthy to put this into ordinance. Um, do I have a second? Seconded by Councilor Kane. Um, any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor? Say aye. Any opposed? The ayes have it. It's going to go into ordinance. Uh, next item on the agenda, Madam Clerk. Number three, 2022-136, in order of adoption of an election calendar for a ward for special election. Motion made by Councilor uh, Kane to approve. Um, seconded by Councilor um, Harris. Any discussion on the motion? Point of privilege, I'd like to just talk a little bit about this uh, political calendar. Um, as Councilor Palmucci has, has uh, vacated the seat and, um, and become a judge, congratulations to Councilor Palmucci, Judge Palmucci. Um, some three weeks ago, I've taken over the role as Councilor, uh, Ward 4 Councilor at the time. Unfortunately, when Councilor Palmucci left office, it was, bef it was in the first year of his term of two years, so in that with the legislation that we have up here, it does not get appointed by us. So we had to keep it vacant, and now there's a special election. Now, if Councillor Palmucci had left on January 1st, it would have been appointed by us because he would have left halfway point or sooner. So with that, the political calendar that I have in front of us, what we're going to vote on with a motion to approve, is um, proving tonight with all the council's uh, approval, is the nomination papers will be released tomorrow. Tuesday, November 15th. Um, the special election, final election, whether it be preliminary or not, is going to be February 7th. So that is a Tuesday. Um, if there's a preliminary, which means it'll have to be two or more, which has to be three or more, is Tuesday, January 17th. So with that, it looks like it's um, there will not be anybody in the seat until at least mid-February. So February 7th is the election with the possibility of a um, candidates, candidates, obviously, to file re, you know, a recount or anything. It looks like you won't see a, a Ward 4 counselor in there until the mid-February, regardless of what happens with preliminary elections. Is that correct? Yes. Madam Clerk? Okay. <laughs> Just wanted to mm -hmm. let that, everyone know out there, because a lot of people were asking a lot of questions about Ward 4, obviously, um, and that is what is in the legislation right now here at the City Council. So uh, with that, we have a motion to approve and a second. Oh, Council, Council Leanne, go right ahead. I just want to really quickly um, shout out and acknowledge, uh, Madam Clerk, you, Amanda, everybody in the elections office, and even Jen, I know, um, has been working nonstop this past week. You all are essentially rolling from a general election right into a special election <laughs> and then right into a, a, an election year here that's happening in the city. Um, you all are nonstop, and, and I just want to recognize and call out that this is a continued busy season for you all, um, and just want to thank you for everything you guys do. So that's it. It's funny, when Council Liang said, I, I asked Madam Clerk, she said, you want to talk? No, you do it. You do it, <laughs> you do it Mr. President. <laughs> so anyway, with that, um, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Councilor Andrew. Yes. Councilor Kane. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor Liang. Yes. Council Mahoney. Yes. Council McCarthy. Yes. Councilor President DeBona. Yes. Seven members. Seven members in the affirmative. Motion carries. Any more items on the agenda, Madam Clerk? That concludes the agenda for that this evening. That concludes the agenda items. Um, communication and reports from mayor, other city officers, and city boards. Madam Clerk, do you have any utilities or anything? I do. I have some um, communications to refer to Public Works Committee for Schedule and in Advertising, 2022 Utility Grant of Location 
um, Mass Electric Verizon for Bellevue Road, and 2022 138 Utility Grant of Location National Grid Watson Road. That's in the public works with um, Chairperson um, Harris, so we'll put those on utilities. Or they need to be advertised, is that right? Yes. They need scheduling and advertising. Thank, thank you so much, Madam Clerk. Um, any other communication reports from mayor, other city officers, or city boards, councilors, anyone? Unfinished business and proceeding meeting. Reports of committees. Councilor Harris, you have the floor. Public Works Committee Chair. Okay. Um, during um, public hearings were held this evening um, for the following orders, 2022-130 utility grant locations, Mass um, National Grid, 44 Prospect Hill, positive recommendation from the Public Works Committee. Motion to approve. Motion to approve um, by Councilor Harris. Do I have a second? Second by Councilor McCarthy. Any discussion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Councilor Andronico. Yes. Councilor Kane. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor Yang. Yes. Council Mahoney. Council McCarthy. Yes. President DeBona. Yes. Seven members. Seven in the affirmative. Motion carries. Very good. Um, 2022 uh, um, 133 utility grant location, Mass Electric 33, Newport Ave. Positive recommendation from the Public Works Committee. Motion to approve. Motion to approve made by Council Harris. Do I have a second? Second by Council McCarthy in discussion on the motion. Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Councilor Andronico. Yes. Councilor Kane. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor Liang. Yes. Council Mahoney. Council McCarthy. Yes. President DeBona. Yes. Seven members. Seven in the affirmative. Motion carries. 2022-134 utility grant location, Mass Electric, 33 Newport Ave, positive recommendation from the Public Works Committee. Motion to approve. Motion to approve made by Council Harris. Seconded by Council McCarthy. Any discussion on this motion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, may please call the roll. Councilor Andronico. Yes. Councilor Kane. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Council Liang. Yes. Council Mahoney. Council McCarthy. Yes. President DeBona. Yes. Seven members. Seven members of the affirmative. Motion carries. That's it. That's it. Just a little point of privilege. I really miss Council Palmucci used to Couple no's in there, so just just anything in his ward. <laughs> Miss him. Kind of laughing over there right now. Presentation of petitions, memorials, and remonstrance. <laughs> Anyone? Presentation of petitions, memorials, and remonstrance. You missed him, Mr. Walker. <laughs> uh, motions, orders, and resolutions. Before we get into scheduling committee meetings and public hearings, I just, I know that Council Pomucci has, has left, obviously, and we, we didn't have really a, a going away uh, up here at the City Council. So at this time, I kind of, you know, I, I, the, the whole time I've been up here, he was before all of us have been on the City Council, I'd looked over at Council Pomucci throughout our time and um, it's almost like a soap opera up here. It's almost like high school all over again. And uh, Council Pamucci and I, <laughs> we'd go through a little period of time, and I know other councils have gone through this, that every once in a while you get in a little riff with each other. You're not talking to each other for like two months, and then you're best friends for like another three months, and then there's a vote up here, you kind of, eh, I don't like that vote, you know? So I know it goes on here still today, but I've been on the council almost eight years now, and I've served the whole time with Council Palmucci, and boy, he was entertaining, I can tell you that much. Um, but um, I wish him well, and I know he's doing well at being a judge, so um, that's a little point of privilege. Scheduling of committee meetings and public hearings. Do we have anybody real quick? A little book, a little beautiful book that Rody was looking for. Anyways, before we, um, Council um, uh, Chair of the, um, Finance Committee, uh, Council um, Phelan is not here tonight, but we will be having a Monday, November 21st at 6.30, we'll have the Finance Committee meeting. It's the uh, Public Safety Headquarters um, will be on the agenda. And then we will go with our City Council meeting at 7.30. Uh, we also have two more meetings in December. We have Monday, December 5th. Um, it looks like I have on here the 
public hearing for the tax rate at 630 and the city council meet at 650. And then our last meeting of the year will be Monday, December 19th, which is 630. So three more meetings to go um, until the new year. Time flies. It's getting cold out there, by the way, too. And with that, motion made by Council Yang, seconded by Council Harris. We are adjourned now at 9.51 p.m.